Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. Please leave a review if you haven't done so already. We sincerely appreciate it. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Scentlock Enforcer, episode number 185. Dave Graham and Jake Huff of the Huff Land Company, buying your piece of whitetail heaven. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by the Scentlock Enforcer, Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, and Morse's Sporting Goods. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. No, Chuck Testa. No, Chuck Testa. No, Chuck Testa. And you're still listening to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast to try and say that three times and not screw it up. This is Dr. Dave Samuel. And you're about to push play on one of the most informative Big Buck podcasts out there. Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Hannah Costello from Hall Brothers Outdoors, and you're about to push play on my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and I am thrilled that you are joining us once again, that you actually had the audacity to push that play button and actually listen to what we have to offer here, where we bring you the brightest and best deer hunters from across the country and deliver them in a manner that you can digest it so that you can use it in your playbook as well. And as usual, when I say we, I'm talking about me and my good friend Dusty Phillips from Ohio. What's going on, my friend? No, oh, it's uh, last week of season here in Ohio, and you know, there's a couple of people I just got a text from actually uh, this past week that laid the smack down on a big old chubby times here in Ohio. So it's uh, winding down, shed season's coming upon us, and yep. it's uh, another way to get out in the woods, and spring turkey not, not too far away, Jay. That is awesome, man. You know, it's it's it feels like winter here in New England, and of course deer season ended quite a long time ago now. It seems like it's been forever. And you're still going in a lot of ways. Uh, so it's, I have turned my sights onto the coyote hunting and I'm using the Fox Pro and we bumped into our friends from Fox Pro, Abner, Drunken Miller and Al Morris, big Al Morris, who has been on this show before. And we got to talk to him a little bit about coyote hunting. Well, I had never really gone coyote hunting. You know, I've killed coyotes by, on random chances, but to actually go hunt them when I was purposely going to hunt them, and, and I've done the, the night hunting and all that stuff, and I've never actually connected with any of the calls that I had. Well, since I picked up a Fox Pro, and we're, we don't have a deal or with Fox Pro at all, but since I picked up a Fox Pro and since I've hu- actually hunted with Fox Pro, the last two days we've called in dogs each day. It's blowing my mind because before... I had nothing going on. I mean, I'm talking about years. And in two days with a Fox Pro, called in two dogs, all within shooting range. Absolutely Crazy. blows my mind. Craziness. Yeah, Fox Pro definitely, uh, man, it's the, the sounds and they, they've put the time in, you know. Yep. They, they've got it figured out exactly what uh, the creation of the sound should be and what uh, what the speakers should produce. And, man, it, it definitely will change the way you coyote on. Yep. And I'm what what the, I've got a good system going right now. I've been going out in the evening for like a 35, 40 minute sit, one set, hunting with a buddy of mine. He's working, he gets out of work, or I'm working, I get out of work. We one of us picks the other up, and we we go. And so far, man, it's been producing. It's just kind of a good way to end your day. Then you go home and do the rest of the stuff you got to do. Right, absolutely. It's definitely uh, healthy for your herd if you can eliminate some of the coyotes and. 
as we talked before, you you don't want to eliminate them all because then you're opening up your place for for the wonder coyotes to come in and reherd in your area. So right, they, they know that like they can they'll have a larger litter. So you want to knock them down, but you don't want to eliminate them. Absolutely right. Yep. Well, very good. Well, we uh, this week, Dusty, we have uh, we're going to be talking about whitetail properties and buying them. And you know, I think in the back of our head. If you don't already own some property of your own that you manage on your own, we always consider down the road that you'd like to own a piece of your own property that isn't for, you know, living. It's for recreational use for game management and land management and and hunting. You know, that's what someday I think we all want to do. So we decided to turn to a couple of experts in Iowa. And although we're going to be talking a lot about buying whitetail recreation property, in Iowa, I think it is going to apply to buying land anywhere in the country in a lot of ways. And we're going to be speaking with Dave Graham and Jake Huff from the Huff Land Company. So we're going to get into that in just a moment. But before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, Michigan says nine township deer cull could begin by this weekend. This story was originally featured on the MLive.com website and was reported by Dominic Mastrangelo. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources could kill as many as 2,800 deer within a nine-township area over the next year after two farm-raised deer in Macosta County tested positive for chronic wasting disease last month. The affected surveillance area covers a five-mile radius and includes lands within the townships of Etna, Deerfield, Hinton, Macosta, Morton, Montcalm, Cato, Winfield, and Reynolds, all in Macosta and Montcalm counties. At this point, it remains unclear whether the CWD positive deer came from a contained, privately owned deer farm or from the wild. Chad Stewart is a deer specialist with the DNR and said sharpshooters will be deployed to target areas by the end of the week. James Averill, a state veterinarian who led Wednesday's meeting, said an investigation to where the two infected deer came from is ongoing. Several local landowners are upset about the effect that this cull could have on the local deer population and may not let sharpshooters onto their property. In the meantime, the DNR is looking to prevent further spread of the disease, which can last in an infected area for decades. Idaho spending 650000 to feed deer, elk, and antelope. This story was originally featured by the ABC Channel 6 KIVI-TV website and reported by Steve Bertel. Idaho is spending about 650000 this winter to feed elk, deer, and antelope in its 110 sites around the southern half of the state, according to Idaho Department of Fish and Game officials. The department on Wednesday says it's feeding about 10,000 elk, 10,000 deer, and 100 antelope. The sites are in areas where officials say an unusually severe winter is causing problems for big game. Officials say the number of elk being fed represents 7% of the state's elk population, while the number of deer being fed is less than 2%. Officials say the emergency feeding is intended to reduce damage to private crops, keep animals from roads, and provide nutrition. The reality is we are only reaching a very small percentage of the population, and hopefully that does those animals some good. But the impact is really isolated, said John Rachel, the state big game manager for Idaho Fishing Game. State officials say deer and elk herds have grown with several years of mild winters, but numbers could decline this winter. Washington House panel okays higher payout for deer, elk, and damage. This story was originally featured on the CapitalPress.com website and was reported by Don Jenkins. Washington state lawmakers are considering legislation to double the maximum payout for crops lost to deer and elk and also compensate farmers for damage by the ungulates to fences and irrigation systems. Instead of $10,000, a Washington farmer could receive up to $20,000 a year under a program administered by the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. House Bill 1399 also would raise the damage threshold for filing a claim from 1000 to 1500 This threshold is being raised to minimize frivolous claims. Farmers who have worked with the WDFW to prevent damage by deer and elk are all eligible to file claims. The compensation program also covers commercial crops, pastures, and Christmas trees, but it does not pay for damages to other property. The state set aside $150,000 annually to settle all claims, though the state has never exceeded that amount according to an analysis of the bill. The agency said it could not estimate how much more the state would pay out under the new bill. WDFW Game Division supports increasing maximum payouts. A farmer must report to WDFW within 72 hours of discovering damage. 
To then file a claim, a producer must hire an adjuster and submit tax records, business records, and insurance records. There are also other bills in the state of Washington to address damage by elk and deer. Interestingly enough, there is no bill or law that would require these farmers to open their land to public hunting before they can file a claim related to wildlife crop damage. Maybe there should be. Maryland teen fairly shoots deer after it busts through the front door of home. This story was originally featured on the Fox 5 DC website and was reported by Anjali Hemphill. A Maryland teenager thought an intruder was breaking into his house when he heard the front door kicked in. Instead, he found himself face to face with a deer standing in his living room. All the homes on his Frederick Street is believed this deer specifically picked Ryan Manchester's house to barge into for one reason, breeding season. We had just cut down our Christmas tree the day before, so we were pretty sure that a doe had sprayed our Christmas tree and that the buck smelled that scent, said Manchester. For several minutes, the eight-point buck that weighed over 100 pounds flailed around his living room, tearing it apart. That is when Ryan decided to call 911 and then his father at work. John Manchester, his father, said his son told him, There is a deer in our living room and I need to know where the keys to the guns are, so that is a lot to take in, he said. Ryan said animal control officers were not able to come right away, and the damage was getting worse. He grabbed his father's 9mm handgun and fired off two shots, hitting the deer in the head and chest. It died on the living room floor. Animal control officers arrived a short time later. It is estimated the deer caused about $4,500 in damage at the home. Animal control officers said while every situation is different and the 17-year-old did not do anything wrong, they recommend not engaging with the animal to get outside and to contact your local authorities to handle it. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Dave and Jake. Dave Graham, Jake Huff, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friends? Great. Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're psyched to have you. We're going to touch on a topic uh, that is, I would think, very near and dear to many deer hunters' hearts, that they may not always execute this idea, but it is certainly in the back of everybody's head that someday, someday you get to buy your own piece of property that you can call your own and hunt it and do whatever you want and manage it as you please. And that's why we're bringing you guys in today from Huff Land Company to give us the ins and outs of how to go about that. And uh, that you guys are the professionals. So we're, we're very interested to hear what you have to say about all that kind of thing when we're thinking about buying whitetail properties. Well, we're excited to tell you. Well, t- tell us a little bit about yourself. Dave, let's start with you. Uh, where are you from and uh, where do you call home? From Cedar Falls, Iowa. Lived, lived here most of my life, uh, grew up in a, a smaller town south of here, but did a lot of traveling as a, as a younger man. Uh, through my 20s, I, I worked in the fishing industry uh, as a rep, and so I did a lot of traveling. I lived in northern Minnesota for a while, but uh, my my passion for, for deer hunting and pheasant and turkey kind of brought me back here, uh, and not to mention my wife, but, uh, you know, just I, I love northeast Iowa, southern Iowa, just it, it's it's truly God's country to us. What did you like the most? You know, it's I got a picture in my head, and it's hard to describe that picture. But okay, you, sitting sitting out in the woods. You know, number one, my whole family enjoys it. My my whole family is passionate about being in the outdoors, and and whether it be hunting or you know, my wife's not huge in the hunting, but she loves to go looking for sheds, and mm. uh, you know, loves to hear the stories of when I take my son hunting. And you know, I just I I, I have a farm that I hunt. And uh, it's by West Union, Iowa. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there in the morning, turkeys start gobbling. And, and I mean, you, you truly know that there's a, a higher power, I believe, when, when you're sitting there and, and it all uh, it all just kind of comes together. Yeah. There's a, a special moment when you're just sitting there watching the sun. Yeah. Rise. Yeah. And, yeah. And just, you know, the, this particular property has deep ravines and creeks and it's just everything that you everything you want. You know, I, I'd love to be able to buy something like that someday. Uh, it just, you know, I, I could spend days up there. Right. Gotcha. Jake, what about you? Where are you from? Um, kind of the same story. Born okay. and raised in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Okay. Um, graduated from Cedar Falls High School. Um, you know, after high school, I went to work for the family construction business. 
So, eh, not to mention as a young kid, I kind of got drugged to work a little bit, even when I didn't want to. Uh, but it served me well. Um, I learned a lot about construction. And and then uh, about 2002, uh, started into full-time real estate. And um, that's what I've been doing ever since. So, haven't really left the area. Um, still live, you know, now I live out in the country outside of northwest of Cedar Falls just a little bit. Mm. Got our offices here in Cedar Falls. It just... Uh, uh, most of my family's here, so it really does. It feels like home. So, gotcha. Really, no desire to go anywhere else. How did you guys get into real estate? Yeah, you know the thing about real estate that I was really attracted to. There, there's so much opportunity. You know, I, as a, as a construction worker, you know, you're, you're always kind of dependent on what the guy next to you was doing. You know, um, if they were slacking, it, it kind of put the workload on you, and it, it, it just it really got kind of tiresome, mm. uh, quite honestly. And um, so, you know, the, the nice thing about real estate that attracted me to it was the fact that, um, you know, I, I got to kind of call my own shots. You're an independent contractor. Um, you kind of get to put your own plan into place. And, um, you know, there's there's some ups and downs. Um, there's no guarantees. It's a strictly commission uh, job. But I, I just like the challenge of that. Um, it, it's just a it's a it's a mental challenge. And, and I think that, uh, you know, my, my work ethic will will pull me through, you know, when things get tough, but, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity in it. You get to meet a lot of neat people, uh, see a lot of great places. Um, and, and quite honestly, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of money to get into it. When you think of the millions of dollars of inventory that we have at our disposal, um, you know, we don't have any carrying costs on any of that stuff. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's a, it, it can be a really uh, rewarding business, I guess. And that's, you know, kind of what drew me to it initially. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dave, how about yep. yourself? I grew up a realtor's kid. Um, my mom was a realtor for 20 some years and she did strictly residential, but, uh, you know, it, living in the same place, same town I do now got to, you know, I knew all the people in the industry. Uh, one day Jake and, and Clint called me into the office and wanted to meet with me. And I had no idea what it was about. I figured it was, they wanted some free tree stands or something like that. <laughs> We didn't put him in a headlock. No, no, there was no strong, strong arming or anything like that. But it, it just, it, my passion is, is the outdoors and man, why not, why not try to make a living doing it, you know? And, um, so it all made sense to me and Jake has been amazing mentor to me and, and, you know, he's taught me so much and, and it's, uh, it's, it's like he said, it's an, an extremely rewarding business. Um, you know, you get to meet some great people and, you know, that's kind of where we, we take pride and, and, you know, it's not over at the closing table with somebody, but, you know, I, I've had people that say, Hey, I'm only buying this property. If you hunt it with me, you know, and, and it's just stuff like that's awesome. That's cool. That's a good gig. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, just to kind of go back to, to that a little bit was, you know, um, we, you know, my, like I had mentioned before, I I'd got licensed in 2002 to sell real estate. Yeah. Got my broker's license in 2005, started a business with another guy doing, you know, a residential office, um, and then uh, went to work for, sold my residential business to my partner, and I uh, was kind of starting to look for something different. I didn't like the direction that uh, residential real estate was going, and um, just, you know, I, I grew up um, loving hunting and fishing, uh, really kind of, you know, it was about the time I was about to turn 40, so, you know, I, I just figured, you know, there's there's only so much time in life. And um, the residential stuff, uh, I could do it and make make money doing it, but it, it just my heart wasn't in it. And so I knew that we needed to do something different. And uh, that's um, at, you know after a two year stint with another company, um, decided in 2013 that uh, we would um, uh, start you know Huff Lane Company. And uh, one of the reasons why we called Dave in is because that we knew that he had the same values that we do. And uh, that's important to us. We know that we, our desire is not to be the largest uh, land company, uh, in, you know, in the world. <laughs> you know, we're, we're focused on Iowa, and that's what's important to us. And that we knew that Dave had it in him to, to really be a great agent, uh, take care of people, um, first and foremost, and, um, you know, put them before his own, you know, um, before himself, I guess, and his, you know, uh, really working for people and, and, and really helping them out. So, and his knowledge of the outdoors just kind of fit in. That's where we're just a little bit different from uh, other real estate companies um, here locally is um, most of the people that work here either live on acreages or will be soon. 
uh, you know, they kind of have that, that country life in their blood. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of our desire is to have like-minded, you know, agents here at the office that, that uh, put the customer first. And we knew that Dave had that in. Him, so we're glad to get him. So I'm blushing over here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you mean he hasn't t- told you this in private before, Dave? No, no. this is the first okay. time I've ever gotten praise. So. Wow. Oh, Thanks, come on. No, that's oh, you must have, like I said. <laughs> about bonus time for that guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My goodness. He's taking down notes. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Well, at the, at the next uh, board meeting, you'll have to, uh, to praise yeah. him and say how, what a good job he did on the big buck. You might have to edit that part out. I'll have to put that on social media. Yeah, I'll get that out there. <laughs> so is there enough uh, business to be had in Iowa to support a land real estate company? Oh, absolutely. All right. Um, you know, it, it's uh, – it, it, it takes a little bit to get in, you know, it, it uh, it's not come easy. Um, the, and so I guess the thing that I will say is that since we are kind of diversified, you know, um, although my heart may not be in residential, like it is land, uh, it has served me well and it serves our agents well because everybody knows somebody that's looking for a house and, and we can, you know, we can, uh, do, do the residential business as well as anybody else. Um, it's just, it's, you know, not, you know, the first thing in our heart, I guess you'd say. Right. So, so we have the ability to help folks with, uh, residential, um, you know, the acreages come easy for us because we identify with that lifestyle. Uh, and then of course, you know, recreational and hunting property, which, you know, most of the people probably care about, um, that are listening, uh, you know, that, that is a little bit tougher in Northeast Iowa, uh, as compared to Southern Iowa, Southern Iowa's just got more land for sale down there. The prices tend to be, you know, 800 to a thousand bucks an acre cheaper uh, than Northeast Iowa. Um, so it, it does present some challenges. You know, we, we've got to just uh, continue um, uh, pushing our message and, and, and getting a lot of the local stuff here and making sure we're, we're dominating our, our, our market here um, locally. And then of course we'll go anywhere in the state, um, you know, uh, to help anybody buy or sell. So, but it's a it's get, and it's becoming a more difficult uh, that you're seeing more uh, companies uh, propping up, uh, popping up, I should say, um, all over the place. So, um, you know, I think being diversified is the important uh, piece of it so that when when maybe something's a little bit slow, um, you know, you're able to to uh, slide over to a different part of the, the you know, uh, real estate business right. and, and carry on. But right. our heart is land acreages for sure gotcha. so, all right so your 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 heart's there um it sounds like a general interest uh as well that in the the types of property that you're selling it's it's like you've gone into a niche that you really yes. enjoy but Correct. there's also uh, a diversification where that's not your own you're not held by just selling land there you do all the other real estate too so you well, the one yeah, absolutely. The thing that I think is important is that if you, you know, if you have a uh, $500,000 house on 40 acres or 80 acres, uh, one of the things that, that, that I see, you know, for us is the fact that we have done a lot of residential transactions. You know, we know, we know how that transaction works. We've done it, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, so, you know, we've got that reputation. We have the know-how to get that done. Um, but at the same time, you know, we can also prom- pr- promote that lifestyle uh, of living in the country and, and what that means. Um, you know, it, it's special to own to own a chunk of dirt uh, land, whether your house is on it or not. It's it's truly a blessing to be able to, to 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 have that opportunity. You know, a lot of other countries don't have that. Gotcha. And um, that's a part of our founding, and to me, it's one of the more important things. You know, when you think about a lot of the stuff that's going on in the country right now, and um, I tell you, if, if you've got a piece of a ground to walk or to, to, to spend time on, it, I think it really grounds you. I think a lot of people have lost touch, you know, with what that what that means. And if they'd spend a little more time, uh, you know, out, out in, in the country a little bit away from everything else, I think maybe people's focus might change a little bit. But gotcha. I guess that's just my opinion. I have I have a million questions for you guys. And I, I think Dusty, uh, most likely his brain's turning over there, too, with a bunch of questions. <laughs> As you're talking, I'm thinking about all these things that I really would like to know about that I didn't realize I really wanted to know about until we started talking about it. <laughs> Let's expand a little bit about just Iowa in general. You see, you have a, a, a very good understanding and knowledge of the state of Iowa. 
Can you mm-hmm. describe in a little more detail what the landscape is in different regions of Iowa? And if we're thinking about buying property in Iowa to hunt on, where would a hunter go? I mean, what what's the best, what's the, the least best, or what's the perceived best, perceived least best? Well, you know, I think um, – I think Southern Iowa gets obviously the most attention just because of the, um, some of the TV shows that are, that are out there. Um, and so I think, you know, most of those originate in Southern Iowa, um, which I mean, it's a, it's a big deer Mecca. It just is the way that the landscape is the rolling Hills, uh, the, the, the ground tends not to be, um, as productive as, as central and, and, uh, Northeast Iowa. Therefore, you, you know, you tend to see, um, more CRP contracts, uh, bigger chunks of timber, just because the ground it just doesn't work as well for planting crops like it does in the central and northeast part. So I think that's why you see more companies and uh, more land for sale in southern Iowa. Um, you know, great deer hunting opportunities, absolutely. Uh, some pretty solid income, you know, and return on investments if that's what you're looking for uh, in a recreational hunting property. As you start to creep north of, say, Interstate uh, 80, um, you know, the ground gets significantly better, um, more suitable for row crop farming. Uh, so you tend not to see a lot of, um, uh, you know, hunting properties uh, pop up. And if you do, they normally go for a lot more money because guys don't want to have to travel. Um, you know, uh, they'll normally produce a, a little more income, but the price per acre will be significantly higher. Uh, as you kind of get... Um, um, probably uh, into the Northeast, say um, Fayette, Clayton, Allen McKee, Winnesheet, Howard, some of those counties that really, it gets very hilly and can be very rugged. Um, but again, uh, pretty fertile soil for the most part. A um, little bit bigger chunks of timber. You know, it grows actually probably uh, some of the best, you know, uh, walnut and, and uh, oak timber that you'll find that, since the ground's a little bit uh, better in Northeast Iowa. Uh, prices are a little higher, of course, um, in Northeast Iowa, but um, that's kind of how, how we see it is that, um, you know, Southern Iowa is going to probably always be a little less money, um, but it kind of depends on where your buyers are coming from and how they're looking at things uh, to what fits into them. Some guys don't, they just don't have the two hour drive um, to get to Southern Iowa every time they want to hunt. Um, and so those guys are looking for something different and, you um, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunities around, but uh, in, in the central part of the state, it's a little bit harder because you don't have the big timber tracks uh, like you will more to the north and to the south of actually where we are. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, I guess. Okay. You know, most most people that hunt love to fish. So, you know, you look at Southern Iowa and it's plastered with farm ponds, you know, all over the place. And then, but uh, you go to Northeast Iowa and, and you have trout streams. So, hmm. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's a very different landscape. Um, you know, like Jake said, you get to Northeast Iowa and you're talking steep bluffs, deep ravines, um, you know, waterfalls, that kind of stuff. And then Southern Iowa, you got more of the rolling hills and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's, we have a place up in Northeast Iowa actually. And, and so we'll deer hunt or turkey hunt in the morning and then we hit the Mississippi river in the afternoon. Um, oh, cool. you know, that's, yeah, that's just kind of good way to fill the day with with the outdoors you know right uh, it sounds like a, a sportsman's paradise in a lot of ways so if we're in southern iowa the the rolling hills you're saying that that's more or less some of the the better deer hunting but in cheaper property o- overall yeah um it, it's you know prices have definitely dropped in in southern iowa in the last couple of years um they're steadily going back up Okay. But I think one of the problems is a couple of years ago, we had a pretty, pretty bad EHD uh, breakout down there and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, lost a lot of the deer herd. And uh, it was almost instantaneous when, when the price started to go down and then Northeast Iowa started to go up. Um, they're starting to level off a little bit, but it's still, you know, it's still cheaper per acre down in, in Southern Iowa right now. Okay. All right. Very, very interesting. Now, when I assume you get calls from all over the country of people that may be considering mm-hmm. Iowa, right? Yep. What are some of the, the top subjects that or questions that people ask you when they're thinking mm-hmm. about buying a piece of whitetail property somewhere in Iowa? You know, everybody's kind of got a different take on it. Um, 
you know, uh, some people are just truly worried about, you know, big bucks. Um, other people look at it as more of a, uh, what can I get for a return uh, on investment? You know, so they're looking for a mix of, you know, uh, timber and crop ground. Um, some people are just in it strictly for recreation. The thing in Iowa that you have to remember is that, you know, there's a lottery they have to go through for to get a, you know, a bow tag. So just because, uh, you know, somebody from out of state owns ground in Iowa doesn't mean they're guaranteed a bow tag every year. Um, okay. So, you know, it's uh, and that's a lot of times that kind of turns some people off. Um, you know, it, we're not an over the counter type state. And um, but uh, yeah, we get a variety of questions, everybody. And, and that's the important thing, you know, is, is to find out who you're talking to and what goals they really want to achieve. You know, what, what is this, what, what do you, how do you see yourself using the, the property? And then we can kind of go through the tedious task of, of trying to match them up with something. And, and that's not as easy as it might seem uh, if you're really um, analyzing everything and making sure they're making a good decision. Um, it's, it's actually quite difficult. We need, we actually need a lot more listings. We got more buyers than we got listings. So really, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now what, why is that? What's the, why is the market that way? You know, and when I say that, I, I, I talk in mostly central and Northeast Iowa, there's normally good farms listed throughout, you know, Southern Iowa. Um, our presence is not quite as strong there as, as it will be in the future, but uh, uh, you know, there's still opportunities to take buyers down there and, and show them some nice stuff. But um, like I'd mentioned before, there's, there's a whole lot of people that just don't want to drive real far. Um, or don't, you know, maybe they're nine to five guys and they only hunt on the weekends or, um, and they need something close, um, you know, and it's easier to get to if they've got kids and all these things. So, um, you know, it's, it's, everybody's kind of got a different, um, use or purpose or a goal. And, you know, I guess that's kind of the, you know, that's what we're here for is to figure that out and make sure that they get matched up with the, the best, you know, property that they can find. And sometimes that takes a while. Really, it's it's not something that, you know, if, if you're planning on buying something for the fall, um, you know, you ought to be looking really pretty hard right now. Um, it, it could even take a year or two before the right place actually comes up. And, um, you know, that's I guess that's kind of the tough part, you know, for us is, um, you know, keeping a list of people that are interested, making sure they're still interested when something does come up. Because um, if it's priced right, um, it, it normally doesn't last uh, too long at all. OK, gotcha. You asking what what do people ask for? <clears throat> Some of them are very specific. Like I want I want a farm that's predominantly oak and you know with ridges or, or whatever. Um, you know something that's already basically turnkey. Um, others, I got an email not too long ago from a, a good friend of mine actually, and he just said he lives out of state. And he says, hey, find me a farm. And I said, well, you need to be a little more more specific. You know what do you want? He goes. Okay, I want the best hunting land in Iowa with a house on it. He goes, "Can you find it?" And I'm like, "Heck yeah, man!" So um, it, it's just everybody. Everybody's different, you know. I mean, obviously, the guy that wants the best hunting land in Iowa is going to have a little bit of all that stuff. With you know, whether it's oaks or, or food plots and, and a turnkey, or um, it just that that's what's exciting about the the land side of it is everything. Nothing is the same, you know. It, it doesn't get monotonous at all, um, and it's fun. You know, I mean, we're, we're taking people through, you know, some of the best land in the country um, and, and, you know, they want to buy it. And that's a lot of times people are, are just uh, in awe and, and ready to sign. Um, and, and there might be something that we see on the property that really doesn't fit them or, or might be a downfall, you know. So sometimes we got to, you know, as, as much as we hate to, we got to steer them away because it's not in their best interest. Okay. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, what are, what are some of those downfalls that that you have identified that might not be you know, for that particular person? There, there's tons of things. Um, you know, one thing I see a lot is, you know, n not only do we sell land, but we're extremely passionate about hunting, and, and we do it a lot, and, and we kind of understand, um, you know, access routes and, and that kind of stuff. You know, one of the things I see a lot of is, is you know, maybe it's got some CRP on the south. Um, it's on you know, the whole property's on north of the road, there's CRP on the south, and then there's a creek north of that, and then there's the timber, but there's no easement from the, the north. So how are you going to get in there um, being unnoticed, you know? Um, just little things like that. Obviously, floodplain, that's that's pretty easy, but, 
you know, some people have dreams of maybe buying it and then building on it someday. And, and it's just not, uh, it's not feasible. And you certainly don't want them to see, you know, their dreams literally washed away in a flood. Um, but I mean, it's, there's, there's so many things that, that come up. Um, but I would say access and, and easements are, are probably the most common. Okay. Gotcha. What about, what about if you got a, somebody that's new in the hunting that has a little jingle in their pocket, does, does it pay for you to be able to explain to them that, uh, the hunting scenario is not the best on the piece of property they want to purchase? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, our job is to have the, the client's interest above ours and anybody else's. So if that's what they're going to do, um, or want to do is, is hunt a property, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be straightforward with them and, and say, look, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a good fit or, you know, depending on, on what their circumstance is, maybe it's, you know, something where they can't get too far away where they can, you know, travel distance is maybe maximum of an hour, an hour. Um, you know, then we'll kind of get into, here's what we can do to make it a better piece of land. You know, is it priced right right now to do these things, you know, whether it be a ridge cut or food plots, um, you know, planting trees, it, it just, like I said, every property is different, but if a client calls me and he wants or she wants, you know, great deer hunting land, it's, that's what I'm going to find them. And, and either they're, they're ready to buy the perfect hunting ground that's turnkey or they're willing to take some time and, and grow it into that property. Gotcha. That makes sense. Very cool. So let's say I call you up and I say, I want a, a great piece of whitetail property. Um, what types of questions do you start asking that client when, when you're talking to them? Uh, probably the first thing is budget. Okay. You know, um, what they're willing to spend, you know, sometimes people have a, uh, a, a total, you know, number budget. Uh, sometimes uh, they have an acre. They, they think they got to have a, a certain number of acres. Um, so, you know, I kind of start there just to kind of figure out, you know, what kind of a budget are we working with? Um, you know, from there, I think you kind of look into a specific location. Do they have any idea of where they want to be? Um, obviously, you know, some people that's a bigger deal than others. You know, some people are or just they don't really care as long as you know it's it's provides the best hunting opportunities um the huntability uh, is another one i think dave just kind of hit on that a little bit um uh, i'll ask them about what their expectations are for income potential uh do they need to see a certain amount of money uh coming in whether that's uh through you know row crop you know rent it out or uh maybe from crp uh income um or, or timber harvest uh just really what their expectations are for income, okay. whether they're buying it on their own or if they're going to potentially go in with another person. Last thing you want to do is be running around the countryside showing somebody, um, you know, hunting properties and then find out, well, I, I got to talk to my partner about it. Um, you know, so I'll normally find out if they're, they're the ones making the decision uh, on their own or, or if there's going to be a group decision made. Right. Um, and it can also boil down to, are they, Sometimes they look at it as a, uh, everybody might look at it a little different, but normally they're looking at it either from a quality or quantity standpoint. Um, like, uh, you know, on our website, we've got the, the, the property down in Tama County. That's 1100 bucks an acre. Well, that, that provides a great recreational all around recreational experience. Um, you know, deer, turkeys, uh, the Iowa rivers right there, but, uh, you know, the income potential is uh, limited due to the wetlands reserve uh, program easement. Um, you know, so a lot of these things are just important to find out um, kind of what their expectations are. And then uh, to be able to kind of um, narrow some properties down from there, you know, obviously being the fact that Iowa, I mean, it's not the biggest state, but, you know, we can spend several hours, um, you know, from one place to the next. It's going to be important to find out, you know, really uh, what their expectations are and, and what they hope to, what kind of goals they have uh, in owning that property. So that can kind of guide us, but okay. um, financing is another one. So if they talk to a banker, you know, uh, most people, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, type of financing than obviously a, a residential or an acreage property. So um, we normally have to hash those things out too, how to plan on paying for it and, um, you know, give some, some suggestions if they need it and see where it takes us. Okay. Gotcha. Let's talk a little bit about income 
potentials for some of these properties. You touched mm-hmm. on these our, uh, CRP, our row crop, um, yep. uh, timber. What types of income can we, could are potentially there? A hypothetical property. What what are the incomes that can come off of some of these properties for timber and row crops? Um, I mean, it, I, I, it, it's an interesting perspective to think that it you is. could have some 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 generating some revenue here. Yeah, um, you know the the from the timber aspect, um, you know I, I I know enough to um, to kind of give a little bit of guidance to them as far as what types of trees are on the property. You know, I could probably give them an estimate of you know. Uh, how many board feet in a tree, um, what that means, you know, what, what that equates to financially per tree, you know, that kind of stuff. But normally if, if we see that there's a, um, uh, you know, a fair amount of timber value, we'll, we'll normally recommend that they get, uh, an appraisal done, uh, on the timber. And, um, I mean, it, it, you can, you could be, you know, anywhere, if you just did a, a small little cut, you know, several thousand to, you know, geez, there's been some, really big walnut sales that are in the tens of thousands, almost, you know, a hundred thousand wow. dollars. Um, they can really range, uh, quite a bit. And it, you know, walnut I use is, is the most valuable, um, uh, species that we've got here, um, in Iowa, but you know, there's, there's maple and, and, uh, oak and just, you know, every, everyone's kind of got a, a, you know, a different price per board foot and it's something to consider. Most guys don't even think about it when they're looking at a property is the timber value. Right. They just want, you know, they just want to have trees to put a stand in and, and they don't even really think about it, but it's an, it's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, some of the challenges with, uh, you know, um, a hunting property is that uh, if we're talking row crop income, a lot of times it's, it's not a huge uh, piece of tillable that, that, you know, so that's, that presents problems for, It'll rule some of the guys with big equipment out, um, you know, so it's going to take a, a guy that's got smaller equipment. Um, not saying that guys with smaller equipment have less money, but a lot of times it's, you know, they can't afford to pay the big rent prices. Um, so, you know, I'll, just kind of knowing the, 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 the general area in which you're in can, um, you know, the the price that you can get per acre uh, from uh, a tenant uh, farming your, your ground uh, can vary pretty substantially anywhere from probably, I would have to say there's not much being uh, rented um, under 200 bucks an acre still, um, and probably some that uh, might still be at 350 bucks an acre uh, for cash rent for row crop. Okay. Um, so, you know, depending on how many acres you got there, and then you got, you know, CRP, um, and that, you know, that kind of takes a, a combination of what the, the, the county of uh, cash rent um, prices are and takes that into consideration. So it's normally pretty comparable. Uh, and of course, uh, the cash rent prices in Iowa for tillable are, are, are coming down. Um, so that CRP is going to be going down. But we've had CRP contracts. I knew one in Butler County that was $400 an acre um, to put into CRP, uh, you know, a 15 year program. And um, so that, that's, you know, income you can count on. Um, it's, you know, it's good for the wildlife. If you like pheasant hunting, you know, turkeys like it, the deer like it. Um, uh, another one that, that sometimes people don't think about is is the WRP program, if you're in the right area, um, which is the Wetlands Reserve Program. Uh, you got to own, own the ground for seven years. Um, but uh, that, that's normally, a, that's a one-time payment. If you put it on a lifetime easement, you're supposed to get cl- fairly close to market value. A lot of times that'll, um, if you own it for, for seven years, a lot of times that can pay for quite honestly most of, of the property. Um, now there's there'll be some stipulations with that easement on things you can and can't do, but uh, it's still yours. You still own it, um, and you still get to hunt it. Uh, you retain all control. You don't have to turn it over to public hunting or anything weird like that. But uh, you know, it's just another you know another piece of the puzzle that. Uh, you get the right place, you could be eligible for that as well. So. Gotcha. Very interesting. So there really is a way to like have, and like you buy a, a residential income property. This, there's almost ways to have land income properties um, to support the cost of, I don't know if the taxes or, or a mortgage or things yep. like that. Um, and, and it sounds like you, you, you wouldn't necessarily be, you'd be the owner, but you wouldn't necessarily be doing the work. You'd be renting out your land to somebody else to do, Mm-hmm. these things or planting row crops and, and renting it out per acre or, or how does the timber work? Do you, re- do you, do you just have a, a logger come in and give you uh, a certain piece per No, kind of how we, how we would handle that. 
um, nothing against the loggers, but probably the safest thing um, to do is um, is to call a forester. And, you know, we know some of those people that we recommend and, um, and, and they basically take care of the whole process. They'll, they'll, they'll come give you, um, cause I've actually gone out on these with a the forester just, just to learn how they do it. It's quite interesting. It's pretty amazing. Actually, those are very knowledgeable people. Mm. It's kind of fun to spend time with them. And, uh, so you go through and you kind of get an, an estimate of, and, and you go through, you mark the trees, um, you know, and then, and then you take measurements on, on projected board feet. And you kind of add them all up, and you and you give the the uh, landowner an estimate of of what uh, a potential sale could look like. And if they think that looks good, then the forester will send it out for bid. And it's normally a lump sum payment, check signed, uh, and a earnest you know earnest check uh, given to the landowner. And um, the the contracts can vary from you know a year to two years for that logger to get in there and um, and and harvest those trees. But having that that safety net of the forester, they do a great job is uh, they're only going to send it out to loggers that they know and trust. And that, um, you know, I even had one where a guy said, you can only do this while the ground's frozen and it has to be after January 10th when, when uh, deer season uh, ends here. And, and the, the logger was fine with that, you know, so you got to be careful um, that, that you don't just, and, and you know, like I said, I, I, I'm, it's nothing against loggers They're you know, they're, they're great, but, for most people, I think that don't know any better, it might just be safer to talk with a forester and uh, go that route. Um, I, I've never had anybody, you know, um, say that they that, that they wish they hadn't called a forester. So it normally works out pretty good. That's fascinating. I had no idea that it was like how elaborate that was. That's pretty. That's, yeah. that's actually very interesting. That's a whole other show, I think, right there. Well, they're an interesting people too. I mean, they they spend so much time in the woods. They're a wealth of knowledge. It's amazing. You know what those guys know. Even our, I got a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, rapport with uh, a couple of the district foresters uh, that work for the Iowa DNR here, and they, they're just some of the neatest people. Uh, very knowledgeable, nice, nice people. Just want to help, um, answer a lot of questions. They're a great resource, honestly. Well, your forester, you probably right. should. You know. Yeah. What What is uh, what's Walnut going for these days? Any idea? Jeez, it could be. I've heard veneer grade, you know, prices is, you know, much as $8 a board foot, hundreds of board feet in a, in a tree, um, which is another thing, you know, you, the forester will always ask plan. Is. And, uh, and so he'll take that into consideration of the cut too. So, okay. you know, most generally they're not going to take 14 inches is kind of the, the, the smallest diameter that the loggers even really want. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real learning experience. And you always tell the landowners that have been uh, that experience because they're, they're pretty knowledgeable. You know, they've spent some time with that forester on their property, uh, learning about the value in trees, you know, what to cut, when to cut them, what happens when you cut them, what, what comes back in, do I need to replant? Um, you know, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole plan to it. And it's, uh, it, it is quite interesting. Gotcha. About uh, to think about. And can you estimate this stuff ahead of time before you buy, or is this something you have to figure out later? Most guys just don't for whatever reason, uh, but they should. And, and for taxes as well, that's, that's a good thing to have uh, because it's taxes, capital gains. So if you if you've got an appraisal done, that'll help you. You know, when you file a tax return as well. So right. um, it's just a, it's just an all around good idea and a, and a good learning experience as a landowner. Right. And what can you expect uh, from the WRP program? for for revenue or you said that it, it sometimes is almost the cost it's a lump sum lump sum payment yeah um and so it it what i've seen in the past is it, it normally reflects market current market value okay so imagine that you know you right. own the property for 7 10 15 years and all of a sudden you know it and most generally i mean you can't just do that for any property it, it, it's you know it has to meet certain criteria most generally, it's got to be something along a river or waterway. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the program is designed to for soil erosion uh, to slow that down, uh, being uh, grazed or, or row crop or you know cleared all the way to the river's edge. So it, it just helps out with uh, erosion and and that's you know and endangered species is another one that they'll take into consideration. So okay, you retain ownership. You retain 100%. ownership. Okay. Yeah. Yep. You know, well, the thing is that you have to remember about stuff that qualifies for WRP is that it, it's it's going to be something that floods a lot, obviously. So it, it's really a 
um, a truly, it's a recreational property, right? So to me, it, it makes perfect sense if, if you know, uh, you own the property, you use it for recreation. If it's not, already, it probably doesn't produce a bunch of income right now because it floods anyhow. So you're, you know, it's not going to be a big row crop uh, income producer. Um, so uh, a lot of times it's, it's a good idea to enroll it. And then you still, you still get to use the recreational, you still get to hunt it and it's always going to have value. So if you get paid for it, I mean, basically you almost get paid out or maybe even make a little money on it. Um, and you still retain it when you go to sell it, it's still going to have value. Um, you know, guys are still going to be willing to pay, you know, thousand bucks an acre. Some of it's gone. I've seen, you know, 1600 bucks an acre it'll sell for even, even after the WRP easement's been on it. Right. So, you know, the, the thing that's important is to, if you're going to own a recreational property, you, you need to have a history of, um, you know, uh, trail camera pictures, um, anything that you may have harvested on the property, turkeys, deer, ducks, fish, anything, um, so that you've got a history because a lot of times that's what helps us sell the property is, uh, you know, if you can show how people are using that property and, and they're having fun doing it, that, that's always going to have value. Definitely. So that's now you bring up an interesting point right there. So you're actually using trail cam photos and harvest reports, mm-hmm. and kill reports from those pieces Absolutely. of property to sell in your niche, your your whitetail properties. So how does that go? So you have a, a landowner. That, how many pictures are you talking about, and, and what's the time frame in which they're keeping these records? You know, it it depends on the time of year, honestly, because you know if we're if we're listing a property right at the beginning of fall, we need those pictures as soon as possible. Um, and it, it just depends on how diligent those people were with the scouting. Um, you know, obviously if we list a property right now, we're still going to see what they have available, what they harvested off the land, but we're also going to do our homework with, you know, our scouting and our cameras and, and, um, you know, just to find out what the property has on it or is capable of having on it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've never had anybody, say, oh, no, I don't want people knowing that I shot that here. I mean, you know, their goal is to sell the property if they call us. So they're they're more than willing to to give us the history of the property. And, um, you know, I, I had a lady, I listed a farm and, and she wanted to give me the, the uh, mount, you know, to take back to the office to show people. I said, well, that's not necessary. You know, we can just take a picture of it. But, um, and, and usually, you know, they're they're maybe selling it to move on to, to bigger, better. You know, or, or they their passion might be to to just you know hobby farm or, or something like that where they're just doing food plots and. Gotcha. And if people are thinking about selling, it, it, it would be a good idea to get a hold of you know, well, I would say us or or an agent that they trust and and start planning for that sale. I think that's important. You know, just shooting from the hip and all of a sudden pulling the trigger um, isn't always the best recipe. And I think unfortunately that's what we see a lot of times is. If we'd have just had a little conversation ahead of time, it, it may have, you know, sub, made a substantial uh, difference in, in in the price that it sells for or how quickly it sells. Because the more history uh, we have on the property, or the more that we know about it, uh, the easier it is for us to, to to feed that information to potential buyers. And I mean, face it, when you're when you're spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even even a hundred thousand dollars, it's a big commitment, and you don't want to make a mistake. And I think that seems to be the 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 mindset of uh, most buyers at the end of the day is they don't want to make a mistake. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of something that you can't just ask your parents, Hey, how, how did you, how do you buy recreational farm? Well, the, most of them haven't done it. Right. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a little unknown to them, but you know, or as a seller, you know, how can I maximize, you know, the sale? And, and unfortunately, if you call us and say, I want to list it in a couple of weeks, you absolutely will do that. And, and we will spend, you know, our own resources, put our own cameras up, spend time there on the property to try and learn what's going on there. So that when we're showing it, we can speak knowledgeably about the property. Um, but normally the hardest ones to sell are the ones that, that you don't have any history and people ask you questions and, you know, you just have to say, well, I'm not really sure, you know, and that's, right. that's difficult. And typically, typically what that would be is, is, you know, a farmer has 500 acres and he wants to sell this 40 acre chunk of, of woods. You know, he's never hunted it. He has no interest in trail cameras, but he doesn't use it for anything. And, you know, he'll want to sell it. So there's where we really have to, you kind of, you know, get in there, get our cameras up, 
and, and do the best we can. Um, obviously, you know, this time of year, I, I have cameras on properties right now because I'm, I'm watching for the, the sheds to drop. Um, but once once they're dropped, you know, then we kind of switch our focus to turkeys. We're, we're still looking at the deer herd, but, you know, people want to see pictures of big bucks. And, sure. you know, they don't they don't they don't want to see a bunch of does, um, even though that's important. You know, um, but uh, the does don't sell it like the bucks. No, that's right. <laughs> I imagine. Right. Well, th- now this is an interesting perspective too. So we've talked about kind of what a buyer has to start thinking about. Um, but how do you, as a real estate agent, that's going to sell this piece of property, put a valuation on a on a piece of property that that you need to put to market? How do you decide what is worth? It, it's kind of complicated, really. That's that's the hardest part, I think, um, of what we do is you know kind of taking what the seller wants to get accomplished, you know, I know this may come as a surprise, but a lot of times they think that their property is worth more than it really is. Um, and, and kind of, you know, getting, getting them to see, um, you know, what, what surrounding properties have sold for, you know, it's, it, it takes a lot of analysis, um, and, and a lot of thinking, um, about each individual property, because each one's unique, you know, there's, there's not, not many of them that are, that are alike. Um, and so you kind of have to take the, the characteristics and the assets and the, you know, kind of the flaws of each property and, and kind of, you know, blend that all together with um, your past experience and, and what some of the other stuff is sold for, um, you know, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, normally it's not, Hey, you need to list at this price. It's a range. And uh, we say, you know, here's the aggressive end and here's the not so aggressive end, you know, and then we kind of, um, nobody's good enough to say exactly what property is going to sell for, because, you know, the thing is, is that, um, you know, people that have the money will determine what that property is worth. And, um, you know, it's, it's basically, I just tell them it's, it's our job to market your property to the best of our ability that we can control that marketing end of it. We don't control the market. Um, you know, you, you put your best foot forward and, um, you put it out there and, and see how the, how, how the public responds to it and you make adjustments as needed. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just kind of a compilation of, of several different things with surrounding sales, what's your farm's got to offer, um, you know, and within that, you know, the, the income, the accessibility, all those different things kind of start to factor in. Um, you know, again, that's where that history comes in. It's, it's, it's a little easier to get you know, a little bit more money or, or shorter market time if, the, if they have a good history. So, you know, it, it's kind of a variety of things. Gotcha. It must be difficult, I would think, to know exactly what's right because unlike residential real estate, you've got yeah. multiple uh, comparables that you can reference. Whereas on land, you don't have a lot of, of comparables, so you have to kind of go piece by piece of what you knew to be true from other pieces of property and then put it all together and see what happens. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, it's uh, a farm across the road could have a, a you know CSR rating for their tillable at 85 and then you get on the other side and it, it could be quite a bit lower so you know that's going to affect the value but yeah it's definitely easier to pull comps on on residential but um you know it, it it's it does it takes a lot of homework and and like jake said you know a lot of people think it's it's worth more um very few think it's it's worth less but our job is to to get them a fair market value on it and so hopefully they like what we have to say and um you know again our, our job is to have their best interest in mind. So um, we're going to do our best to give it to them. Right. Gotcha. So my, my wife is a big fan of the show fixer upper, right? (laughs) And it's, it's dragged me into the world of that whole fixer upper thing. (laughs) All right. And to the point where I actually uh, handmade a, a beautiful country farmhouse table for Christmas mm-hmm. because and that, nice. that's what you wanted. So that's what I made. If you take that whole idea where you buy a house that's really falling apart, needs a lot of work and you can, with the right help, you can go in and turn it into something good, but you have to have a vision. Mm-hmm. Does that same thing happen with land where, well, it's, you know, it's overgrown. Nobody has been paying attention to it, but with some yeah. time you can go in there and probably at a good price, turn that into a really good piece of property. The answer to your question would be that that vision is huge. I mean, um, you know, we, we talked to a guy today that uh, um, when he bought one of his first farms, you know, they were looking at a farm and it, it just it didn't make it wasn't real, wasn't real pretty. But, you know, through a little bit of vision, casting and, and talking through it, um, you know, guy made a plan, 
of what he would do. And, um, you know, he ended up buying it. You know, a lot of other people were looking past it, ended up uh, being a really good investment for him. He turned it for a pretty good profit a few years down the road. Um, but, you know, vision, being able to see stuff is very important. Um, and as agents, that's where we're constantly learning, too. We, we don't have all the answers all the time. But but I'd like to think that every every time we do a transaction, we get just that much smarter. And, um, you know, helping people to see uh, what something could be is 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 big. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, it, it's kind of it's kind of like our job to be a business partner of sorts and, and to be able to, you know, um, uh, not just to help match them up to buy the right property, but, you know, vision, seeing that, like you were talking about how they're doing that on fixer up or what the, what the residential stuff, but uh, it is very much the same. It is a lot about vision and, uh, and, and the knowledge, you know, to, to help, um, you know, give direction is also very important. So, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good comparison. Okay. You, you're talking about fixer up or uh, I believe it was Jake that just not too long ago had a call to go look at a farm and, um, just assumed that this was this particular tillable land was was in crp and it actually wasn't they just had let it grow Hmm. and um you know unfortunately that's that's just a that's income property for that that person selling the land um but it's going to take you know it's going to take some work because the the, for the buyer um there's obviously more value in, in the tillable um depending on the, the person, but it, it wasn't enrolled in a CRP group program. So they were making zero dollars off of it and just a beautiful farm. But um, every everyone could use a little uh, fine touch, you know. Gotcha. So everything has needs. It's like, I guess, buying any house, you know, there's nothing's ever perfect. Um, even the ones that were newly constructed, right? There's always something that's yep. not quite yeah. right. Yep. So, yep. so how do you how do you go about the, the habitat, when you look at these things, you look at these pieces of property, you look at accessibility, you look at revenue, you look at uh, potential sales to for a WRP program. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you're looking at the income side as a business proposal. Um, but what about the habitat that you're you're looking at for the species itself? How much of, of that plays in other than game camera photos and things like, like that? Are you trying to put together some kind of a habitat plan here as well, even though you're not technically uh, game managers, you're not foresters, but you kind of have to have a sense of it? You know, a lot of the times we'll we'll get a, a farm that, like I said, they, they all need a little bit of tweaking. A little bit of jack of all trades, master none on um, some some cases, you know. Um, you know, normally uh, that experience that, that just comes from, um, being out in the woods, um, seeing how how um, animals operate in different environments, what they like, what they don't like. Um, you know, we can share our past experience with, you know, and, and at the end of the day, we don't have all the answers, but normally we, we can find the people that do have the right answers. And I think that's important to know what you don't know and um, and get them in touch with somebody that really is an, an actual, you know, expert in that, in that habitat field, whatever that might be. Um, but at, Obviously, in the in the timber industry, that that forester, that knowledgeable forester, the guys from pheasants forever, the biologists there, you know, wealth of knowledge, um, turning people on to QDMA. Um, you know, I think those are all great resources that that we'll always lean on and kind of point people towards. Um, you know, the the NRCS or the FSA office. Uh, we we normally always recommend that they they stay in touch with those people as far as programs that are available uh, to them, um, and, and just getting to know those those folks so that. Uh, if the opportunity does come up, they'll remember that landowner, you know, expressing interest uh, in a certain program. So um, kind of, you know, sometimes you, you just got to be careful that, you know, you're giving good advice. And at the end of the day, if you don't have the right answer, you get them in touch with the right people that do. Gotcha. All right. Very good. What's oh, an acre in southern Iowa go for? <laughs> well, you know, I'd say, you know, kind of like if you were looking at them uh, mostly, a timber property in in southern Iowa, you know, um, with with very little open ground, you know, you're, you're going to be probably anywhere from depends on on the seller, uh, but uh, you know, that's going to vary probably twenty seven hundred to uh, you know three thousand bucks an acre, something like that. Could be less, okay. um, you know. Uh, whereas northeast Iowa, it's hard to find anything, you know, under three. Um, you know, most generally in, in straight timber, you know, if, if it's got much value to it at all, uh, it's where it could be harvested in the next, you know, five, 10 years, 
it's going to be over three. Um, now you look at tillable ground, um, you know, Southern Iowa, you know, you're looking at a good rule of thumb right now for Southern Iowa might be, this is just a rule of thumb. It's not hard and fast rule. There's going to be, you know, if it's tiled, you know, how it lays, you know, accessibility, waterways, all these different things factor in. But let's just say a good round number uh, for it is, you know, in Iowa, we've got what they call a corn suitability rating. Um, and what that is a CSR uh, was what most people are used to hearing. Um, Iowa State just, you know, kind of changed that up on us and went to a CSR two, which is supposed to be a more accurate uh, uh, soil type than the CSR uh, was. So if you if you let's just say you had a, a 50 CSR two farm, uh, that's what your corn suitability rating is. About a hundred, you know, about a hundred bucks a CSR point. Uh, so about five thousand bucks an acre is what your tillable ground would probably probably be worth. Um, you know, that's just a rule of thumb. It's a, it's a general number. Uh, now if you get to um, uh, you know central Iowa or you know spots in in northeast or you know southern iowa to where the csrs are much higher um you know 85 90 plus um you know they're probably going to get more than that uh, 100 bucks a csr point if they're tiled and lay nice um so it, it you know and, and the reality is is probably i would say it was uh, about f- mm, four years ago almost five now uh kind of when things started to kind of uh the the tillable ground started to lose uh, a little bit of value here in iowa those CSR uh, two numbers were like uh, one hundred seventy five dollars a CSR two point. Okay. So you can kind of see where the, the tillable ground's gone just due to you know commodity prices. Right. Um, you know, corn was over seven bucks a bushel, whereas now you know it's closer to you know three and a quarter. Right. Well, huge variations there in, in what you could buy. Yeah. A piece of property for. Um, yeah. Should I be considering? Let's say I'm I'm going to buy I don't know 80 acres, and I want to be able to hunt on it. And I'd like to some rental or uh, revenue from it. Should I be thinking about putting a building on that if there isn't one already? You know, I've had people ask me that question, and uh, you know, every situation is different. It depends on. To me, um, I'd be careful if it's if it where you put that building, and if it's going to affect the hunting. Um, you know, if it, it depends on it has a few factors. I mean, if you're in a in an area that it, that, that you've got large tract owners, um, you know, that are that are practicing QDMA, um, and uh, you know, and you decide to put a, a a cabin right in the middle of your your 80 acres, I think that's probably going to be and and it could be a mistake. It depends on how you want to you want to you know spend your time with your family and your friends on your 80 acres. If that's your dream, then man, go for it. But if if your goal is to maybe turn it, you know, in five, 10 years, I would probably say, you know, you might want to rethink that building, either location or putting it on there at all, um, because it, it, it could turn some people off. You just have to be kind of thinking about um, how, if you're going to hold on to it long term and that's that that was your dream and you, you just picture, you know, yourself, um, you know, hanging out in the cabin you know, during the rut with, with family and friends and, and you want to be right in the middle of it and go ahead, you know, do it. But uh, otherwise, if, if your goal is to, to turn it and move it to 160 or something, uh, that, that uh, building that, you know, uh, building on there, uh, you might want to be kind of careful where you put it. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I know you guys aren't bankers uh, per se, but and, but you have to have. Dave's got a lot of money. Dave's got a lot of money. So maybe we could borrow some money from Dave. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, are, these, are these are these pieces of property without buildings on them financeable? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um. You know, a good. Uh, so a lot of the people that we meet, um, most generally, uh, already are kind of established financially. Um. Okay. You know, so you can you can be fairly creative. Like I've I've got one right now where a guy will do a contract. You know, um, depending on the strength of the borrower, he may still want. You know, the, the magic number most generally. And then I say generally is 20% down. Um, if you've got a good relationship with your bank, uh, most generally those guys will do that with 20% down. Um, you know, it, some places might want 40% down, you know, it, it just kind of depends, but most generally if you've got good credit and, and you're a strong borrower, you could, you could, uh, get, get away with 20%. Normally they're amortize them over 20 years. Okay. Some might be 15, you know, but, um, um, you know, sometimes they don't even do appraisals. You know, I've, I've got a guy that, that's, uh, 
ready to buy. And as long as the borrow, he's not borrowing more than two hundred fifty thousand, they'll do a what the banker calls a drive by appraisal. He'll go drive by the property, make sure you know it, it's uh, it, it appears to be what what uh, the buyer says it is, and and you know with their good credit and twenty percent down, you know they'll they'll even waive the appraisal. So um, you know, and we have contacts. Um, some, some bankers have no interest in loaning on land. And if you kind of get that, that feeling, you probably just maybe need to look somewhere else, uh, on the financing end, but, um, um, you know, income from, of course, the bankers always want income, you know, right. they love that. Um, so that'll always help, but, um, you know, not always necessary. And, um, so, you know, you can always start off with a small one too, and, uh, buy the right piece and, you know, over time kind of kind of move your way up but uh gotcha. and also the other thing to think about is if, i mean even if you have equity in a in another uh, another property or something a lot of times they can use you know tie up that equity and you won't, you don't have to put any money down you know if you don't want to put cash down uh they can you know many times use another asset tied to that farm right gotcha is there um any owner financing going on anymore yeah I, like i said i got one um you know and you know, he never really thought about it, but I said, well, you know, if it helps to sell it, um, you know, and you start looking at the numbers of, you know, how much extra money, the interest that they're going to make on that, you know, um, on, on doing the financing is pretty substantial. I mean, it, it's a, it's kind of a big deal. Right. Um, so once you start scratching those numbers out for them, all of a sudden, you know, um, and, and there seems to be a lot less risk. I mean, you can write that contract so that they can't harvest trees without approval, you know, it's, it's, so it's a lot different than a residential property where someone's living in your house and they could trash it overnight. Uh, most generally in land, it's a little bit safer. You know, if you've, if you've got, you know, even 10% down, um, normally they're not going to walk away from that. And, and, and they're, you know, you, you just don't have the same issues. I mean, right. most of those guys uh, will take care of the property. They've wanted one forever. They get the opportunity and they're going to take care of it. Um so it, it, yeah, it absolutely can be done. Some guys don't, you know, if you don't own it free and clear, you can't do a contract, you know, but, uh, but there are some opportunities out there like that. So. Gotcha. I didn't know if that was still happening, especially for land. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So and the other piece of this whole thing that, that you sometimes hear about is, you know, you're, you're talking about dividing, sometimes dividing up, uh, you know, pieces of property that were belong to the farm or, uh, you know, two farms split. And there's like the, all this title work that goes into it. And, and you're wondering about your deed. Is it, is it safe? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you ever bump in any issues with that kind of thing? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, one of the toughest things about our job is it it is uh you got to be very careful about uh property lines and how you represent those property lines because many times we're taking the the owner's word for it uh a lot of in iowa a lot of times you can get on the assessor's pages and you see aerials and it'll it'll show you what the approximate property lines are and uh so sometimes you know those things are just right on and sometimes they're not um but that's that's definitely an issue in iowa we're an abstract state so there's you know, it's, um, you know, there's always a history there, um, but you can absolutely get into, uh, you can get into trouble. Uh, we, we're very cautious about um, explaining to buyers that, that they can, they could do, have a survey done, um, you know, uh, just, just to make sure. Uh, and, and that would help protect them, um, you know, in a purchase. And heck, if you're making a strong enough offer, you might be able to convince the seller to even pay for it. But, uh, you know, really, it kind of falls back on the buyer to do their due diligence, and you know, they can get a title opinion uh, to make sure we're, we're um, you know, getting a clear, clean title. Uh, we still have title insurance as well for for some of that other stuff, but uh, um, that is one of the tough ones in our business is property lines because a buyer wants to know what he's getting, and uh, trust me, some of the sellers don't don't make it easy for us. So that that's probably the number one challenge, at least for me. Um, in this business is, is knowing where the property lines are. And, and a lot of times there's not fences, you know, there might be remnants of fence posts, but you know, you got to get out there and try and, and make heads or tails of it to the best of your abilities. And then, you know, let the buyer know, Hey, if you really want to know where everything's at, you're going to have to pay for a survey. Gotcha. Do you, uh, as a real estate agent, when you're out in the field and you're looking at some of these large tracts of land, or maybe just you know they're they're not that big, but they're 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 big to somebody that's uh, residential. 
Is there, mm-hmm. do you use any of those like, um, apps that, uh, like hunt stand or something like that, where you can actually go out and see yeah, the, the property I lines do. and how accurate are those? Uh, they seem to be quite all right. I'm trying to think of what the name of the one Onyx Onyx. Yeah. And we put that on our phones and it, it, it seems to be okay. I think it gets you close. Mm-hmm. Like if a guy told you there's a property pin, um, you know, in this, in this, you know, Southeast corner, uh, I would trust it to get me, you know, or he says there's a T post or there's, you know, there's an old, 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 you know, wooden corner, corner post. And, uh, there's a, you know, there's a survey stake uh, in the ground. Well, I'd probably trust it enough to go find something like that. But, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where, man, it just, it makes it kind of tough. Um, right. but we do, we do use those a little bit. You know, Google Earth we use all the time too, but it doesn't really show you property lines. We'll, we'll kind of take a mix of, you know, uh, uh, the assessor pages and uh, look at those a little bit, but, you know, they're not always exactly right either. Um, and in most generally, in most cases, if there are fences up and they're kind of what everybody's agreed to as the, the, the property lines, the survey won't matter anyways. That's what, you know, eventually that becomes the law of the land. So Gotcha. Okay. Well, it's it's fascinating. I think some of these topics are not unique to Iowa. I think it's pretty much anywhere you're trying to buy some kind of uh, recreational property, especially for, for yeah. hunting. Um, mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's fantastic. And I, I think we probably go on for a very long time. We've gone on for quite a yeah. while. But I want to get mm-hmm. into some of the, some of your hunting. And I figured out what you guys are doing. This is like a giant scouting adventure for you. This yeah. is, right? This isn't real estate. You're you're scouting for yeah. better properties to hunt. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we learn, we learn a lot, that's for sure. And it's yeah. fun. It's exciting. Um, but, uh, now we got, we got bills to pay kids, you know, kids at home, they need new shoes. So we, we got to yeah. turn the stuff. So no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, no. I'm just picking on you, but it, it, yeah. it, 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 it must give you a fascinating viewpoint of, I mean, you look at a lot of properties and you would as a real estate <laughs> agent, cause you got to sell them, but you're also must be yeah. digesting a lot of the content that you're you're taking in. Yeah. I mean, you're you're visually looking at. Well, you know, here here's a deer run over there. This, you know, this is what they're yeah. doing in, in this particular part of of Iowa. Mm-hmm. So the 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 strategies and techniques that you must employ in this area are probably unique. Yeah. On, if they're on this farm, yeah. and I get to hunt the farm next door, they're probably a similar herd, and this is kind of their travel route. Yeah. So that's right. I want to get into some of the things that you've dis- unraveled as you've gone around Iowa trying to uh, sell property and get into some of your hunting strategies and techniques that you've developed for yourself. Well, um, I, I remember I had one farm listed and there was a, a beautiful home on it and the she was widowed, uh, super, super sweet lady, and she moved to Minnesota and she said, if you want to hunt it, go ahead. And mm. she said, you can stay in the house. I'm like, okay. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, just this, this huge 300 square foot, beautiful home that I'm, I'm sleeping on a sleeping bag in the floor, but I was hunting probably, well, I know it was the biggest buck of my life. Um, and I actually, I'll never forget this day. I think about it almost weekly, but, um, if not daily, but I real heavy snow coming down zero wind. And I had a decoy on the ed- edge of a cornfield. And all of a sudden I saw him, he was heading down the ravine. He was about 40 yards behind me. So I hit the grunt tube and, and he started coming in, but he was really slow and he wasn't acting aggressive at all. And especially once he saw the decoy. So I'm thinking, man, he's going to, he's going to bolt any minute. Uh, he got, you know, it was, if it was 10 yards, I'd be shocked, but it was my first window because he was coming in behind me. And so I, I just started to draw my bow back and I was going to wait for that right minute. Well, the snow had a, like built up on my sleeve and it, it cracked and I'll never forget that deer turning and looking at me. I mean, I wasn't even at quarter draw yet and it just, it spun out of there. So I, you know, of course tell everybody about it. And I, I got to know the farmer that was the neighboring property and I was telling him about this deer and I actually showed him a picture of it. And the next day he wrote an offer on that property. <laughs> so, gotcha. um, you know, it definitely helps, but it's also, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, a lot, a lot of people want us to hunt their property, um, especially if they're not hunters, but the downfall is, is you don't really have a history. Um, so you really, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you guys, you do your scouting and, you know, you, if you hunt the same farm a couple of years in a row, you kind of get an idea of their, you know, their bedding, 
habits and, you know, where they're running during the rut. Um, but, you know, if, if we're listing a farm right now, we're, you know, we got our summer scouting and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, hopefully it's sold by the fall, but if it's, sometimes it's a downfall, I guess I'll, I'll say that. And, and, you know, Jake and I, at the beginning of this year, I know we hunted a lot of our own personal, not our farms, but just ground that we had, uh, history with. And then, um, I know Jake started hunting a property that he had listed and he was calling me every night saying, man, you know, I saw this one and I saw this one. And, um, you almost get confused and, and maybe lose sight of, of, uh, you know, why you're out there. If right. that makes any sense. Right. right. Yeah. I forget why you're, why you're there <laughs> in the first place. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Um, what kind of st- styles and strategies of techniques, uh, do you employ, uh, in that part of the world? And is, are you a tree stand hunters, ground hunters? What, what types of things do you, do you look at? Bow hunting mostly, Bow hunting. at least for us around in the office. Yeah. I mean, we're, that's, I know I can speak for both Jake and I, that's, that's where our passion lies is, okay. is bow hunting. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's mostly tree stand hunting just because that's what we like, but you can certainly hunt out of a ground, ground blind. Uh, my son is, you know, he just turned 10 and he's not pulling back that energy, you know, shooting the kinetic energy out of his bow yet that I feel comfortable with him shooting a deer, um, ethically. So yep. I still have him using a muzzle loader. And so with him, I'll usually hunt out of a ground blind. Um, but, and, and, you know, that goes for turkeys with turkeys. If we're bow hunting, you know, usually we're in a ground blind, but if I can get up in a tree, I just, I love it. You okay. know, again, that comes back to the very beginning of this where, you know, I love watching the, the world awake and, and, uh, you know, I, I love getting down at the end of the night and going home and, and telling my family, my story or, or Jake or, you know, any of my friends. So, gotcha. Uh-huh. Okay. So mostly, but, mostly bow hunting, mostly tree stand hunting. And, uh, do you guys get into scent control? Are you fanatics? I'm crazy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife, my wife thinks I'm insane. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I wear rubber gloves. I mean, I'm, I'm crazy about it. And, you know, <laughs> we were talking about this not too long ago, but I honestly can say that this is, this was my best year bow hunting ever without harvesting a mature buck. Gotcha. Um, just the sheer numbers. My target buck was within 20 yards, three different times. Mm. Um, I never got busted, honest to God, once for scent, but I played it really smart this year. Um, I, I was seen in the stand. I may, might've been seen moving, uh, doe would bust me, but it wasn't, it was never a scent issue. Um, so yeah, I, I take it to a, a little bit of extreme. Okay. Um, can you, can you break it, that down for us? Like how extreme and what, what specifically are you doing? You know, I, I like I said, I, I'm very adamant about the rubber gloves. I mean, I wear them when I'm getting dressed. I wear basically pajamas out to the wood in my tr- in my truck. Okay. Get out and slip on my clothes. Um, ozone generated gear bag has been an absolute game changer for me. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously it works. It gets rid of bacteria. And then so much of bow hunting, I think, is, is a mental game, you know, focus. And if you feel confident, you're going to get it done. And you know, that's certainly added, uh, an added, uh, you know, bonus, bonus to the way I hunt. I mean, I'm already wearing scent locked. I mean, you guys, if you told me that, that you guys could sell me something, I'd buy it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, how I, um, I mean, I want to get as close to as many deer as possible. I want my kids and my family to, uh, do the same thing. And, and I'm, I'm extremely adamant about, you know, washing my clothes and, um, but the, the that scent crusher stuff, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to check it out, but it's 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 really neat. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm a believer in the ozone, especially in that quantity. It's uh, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. It really does. But you work. just got to kind of control the things you can control because there's right. there's a lot of things we have no control over when it comes to hunting whitetails or even turkeys. Right. And uh, so if you can kind of control the things you you can control, I think it, it definitely will help you out. What about camouflage? Um, you, uh, you get in the particular camouflage. Is it important to you? I, I think it's definitely important. You know, um, in Iowa, we start with a ton of foliage in, in the early season. You know, it's, it's still really green. And, um, you know, I, I just, I look for something with a little bit of a green pattern, whether it be, 
you know, Realtree Extra, Mossy Oak. Man, there, there's so many great companies out there now that, that make camo. Um, it's hard to pick. Um, but, you know, as, as the season wears on, you know, you start getting the brown leaves. And, and then the green is doing you really, you know, not a whole lot of good. And we could probably do a whole episode on on camo. But, you know, does it is it really super important? Well, I, again, I'm going to take every advantage that I can. So. Sure. And how about uh, your your bow setup? What are you guys shooting for bows? Uh, I got um, the old Matthews Creed. You know, it's it's, it's been good to me. So yeah. Um, you know, I'm I may might make a change for this next year, but as Dave said, it's there's there's a ton of great companies, and that goes for bows too. And it, it is mental and having you know just what I've learned. Um, you know, I didn't even really start hunting deer until 2008. I was a pheasant. Uh, pheasant hunting guy pheasant population took a crash when land prices went up and all the row crops started taking over the crp and so you know i'm i'm uh, kind of you know i haven't even had 10 years of experience and i i've, I've really been soaking it up and and uh and learning quite a bit but so uh, that confidence is what i you know confidence in, in what you're using and what you're doing i think means means a lot and you know it's it's important to, to have that plan and then see how your plan uh, unfolds. Because if you're just going out willy nilly, uh, I don't. I think it's kind of hard to learn. So, um, what I've learned is that uh, I, you know, I've got the, the Matthews bow, and uh, I've shot a couple other ones, and it's it's been good to me, and uh, I feel confident with it. And uh, I guess that that to me is my number one priority is confidence. So, gotcha. Yeah, I just actually um, I I have a Matthews Halon six that I absolutely love, but I just actually, uh, ordered a expedition. Mm. So I'm excited to get that and, and shoot it. I shot them all at the ATA show and man, there's like Jake said, there are some great bows out there and, and they're all great. It's just, you know, you can't push one because my bow might not be perfect for, for you or Jake or, right. and it just, it's what feels comfortable. And, and that new expedition is, is, uh, is sweet yeah the, the technology of today the, the all there's so many good bows out there it's insane it's crazy yeah. and you know you, you always think every year like how could they possibly come up with something mm. better or faster and you know i'm not a speed freak by any means but they still do it right you know i mean they, they still are getting faster and faster but you just think at some point they're going to peak well it, it hasn't happened yet right it's amazing uh, how about these mm-hmm. you're a big tree stand guys what, what kind of tree stands are you hanging um, well, I, I'm a little biased. I, uh, I, I actually, I work for advanced takedown tree stands. Um, but the reason I work for them is because I do believe that they're the, the safest and easiest to hang. Um, absolutely love that stand. It's a, it's a three-part system where our motto is hang the stem, not the stand. Yep. So you're hanging your, your stem, uh first and you know it's just not so cumbersome um and and then the beauty of it is you can put whatever the size of your property is say 10 stems all around the property or or all the farms that you hunt and just take your platform and your seat with you and and basically you have 10 stands with with the purchase of one and the purchase of uh some stems so i'm an advanced fan um you know i've used other stands before but Safety is is a, a huge part for me. Uh, I, like I said earlier, you know, my my son's getting into it. I'm hanging some double sets and, and taking him along. And um, I, I'm not a I'm not a fifty nine dollar stand guy. I mean, it's it's got to be safe and secure. And and advance has proven itself. And and then I was fortunate enough to get a job with him. So gotcha. gotcha. I've been kind of um, uh, I was on. With lone, well, the lone wolf stands uh, been really, really good. I used, uh, I think I got like three of those, and I've got two of the muddy hang-ons as well. Um, I, I'm kind of more of a hang-on guy. I don't, I don't. Uh, um, ladder stands are, are okay if you got to pop something up quick, I guess, or whatever. But I, I like the hang-ons uh, personally, and uh, I'm kind of switching over. Bought a couple of advanced tree stands. Uh, Dave's tip to me. And, Imagine uh, that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty, and, uh, they're pretty nice, wife, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are. My <laughs> wife was hunting with me, and we were trying to. This is kind of our first year of toying around with filming, and uh, and they've got that. It's like a recliner up there, almost this 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 seat, and and she sat in it. Uh, I didn't know how good it was because I had the regular seat, which was nice. But then one day I went up by myself and sat in that. It's like a 
a director's chair or something. And man, I couldn't believe it. All day sits are like nothing. I only <laughs> gave them one. So they were fighting over it. Yeah. Right. That's funny. No, it, they are nice. Cause the way that they, they strap onto the tree is, man, that's just rock solid. So I was kind of impressed with that. So I'll be probably selling my other ones and, and going uh, with, with advanced tree stands as well. But you know, one thing is uh, that I think is important um, is, uh, is the safety aspect of it from from our you know standpoint is if we sell a farm to somebody uh they get tree stands they get kids out is the safety harnesses and the lifelines right, um right and that's that's one thing we 100 percent believe in and i just think you're a fool not to not to use them uh i'd hate to ever sell a property to somebody and not mention at least maybe buy them a couple as closing gift or something uh just so they don't have an excuse because you just hate to see somebody and it's happened. It happened to one of Dave's friends in Northeast Iowa. And when he was there, how many other guys had fallen on tree stands? Two others, the, yeah. like that same day. Wow. It's so important. I mean, we can't stress it enough. We're, we're fortunate enough here that, that we have a, a, an affiliation with Hunter Safety Systems. And, and those guys are, I mean, they truly care. Um, you know, I mean, they want to know the stories, how we can help and, and how we can, you know, stop somebody from falling again. And, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we're here to save lives, but when they hang up the phone and then you're talking in an office and they, they still talk about it, I mean, that's that's when it's real, right. you know? Right, right. The, the yep. lifeline is probably the, the, one of the best, most simple inventions I think the, the hunter's seen in quite a long time. Yeah, and we're not getting, we're not getting paid to say this, but, no. but the, the reality is, is the reason why we spend so much time out there is the memories. You know, it's, it's, it's who we are. It's what it's, it's all we got at the end of the day is, is the time spent out there, the memories that we share, the time spent with other people. Why in the world would you not, uh, what kind of memory is that going to be if you, if your best friend falls out of a tree, you know, over, over a hundred dollar harness and a, you know, a $20 lifeline. It's right. crazy. I yeah. just said, breaks your heart when you see guys losing their lives or, or breaking, breaking their necks or paralyzed, falling out of a tree. Right. It's so uh, it's not necessary. So yeah, it turns some of your your best memories into some of your worst. Yeah. You know, it's just awful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. With you, on that. you hear about it every year. I mean, it's you know, one of the things I found is it's it's harder to get somebody that's been a bow hunter for thirty years to use a lifeline mm-hmm. than somebody that's brand new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my uncle's a, a perfect example. He he kind of took me under his wing when I was younger and, and really kept me bow hunting and, and got well. He, I mean, he kept me bow hunting. So I feel, you know, I love taking him with me now. And, and I'm like, use that lifeline. And, and, you know, I'd give him some for, for gifts. And, and for the first couple of years, he just wouldn't use them. And I'm like, what is the hang up here? Why are you not doing it? I'm just not comfortable with it. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, I'd be more comfortable if you were using it. So um, it, it's just, it's crazy how, you know, it's, it's so much easier to get somebody new in the uh the outdoors to to use the safety products versus somebody that's been in it for a long time and and probably know people that have fallen out of stands but still don't use it Mm -hmm. right Right. yeah it's it's kind of perplexing and i've never really understood that but yeah well we're still doing our best we're we're we're, uh we have our tree stand harness uh program we're doing right now and we've been collecting uh, given given out any um non-expired tree stand harnesses that uh we have still in the package from those tree stands that you know those tree stands come with harnesses and they're finding out there a lot of people don't even have a harness so we've we've been collecting them from a anybody that's donating if they're still fresh and in the package and we're shipping them out to anybody that requests them so hopefully we're doing it's going quite well it's actually much more popular than i imagined so we could probably send a few your way yeah i think we'll actually send some your way but man that that's awesome that you guys are doing that and and again it's just you know us as hunters we we truly do care about one another you know um yeah we might if jake shoots a 200 this year and and i don't there might be a little grimace on my face but uh, at the end of the day i still want him to come home you know and it's it's so important to to be safe and and the fact that you guys are doing that's that it's huge so thank you very much for it was we'll we'll, we'll send you some more if you want them yes i'll take as many as you can offer yeah well there's all right it's i'm still stunned at how many people actually need them so yeah Yeah. we'll, we'll keep doing our part um so i asked 
both of you guys to think of your most memorable deer hunt before we started. And I, w- I wanted to kind of touch on that. If you could uh, open up and let me know who's going to start and where we're going to go. Uh, I guess I'll start. Um, okay. You know, guys, it, it actually, it, it it's amazing how your priorities change when you have kids. Um, it, this year is probably my most memorable and it, it was with my son and I I've been fortunate to shoot some really nice deer. Um, but the hunts with him and, and like I said, he just turned 10, he was nine last hunting season. And, um, I had a farm that, um, it wasn't for sale. It, it was something that I had a little bit of history with and, um, got him on there and got him in a blind. And the, the, the what happened is, is he's seen some of the trail camera pictures of the deer that I have on that, uh, property and the it, it was almost disturbing to me that, to think that my nine-year-old is, is head hunting, you know, and right. he was passing on deer and, and well, so the first night we're out there, of course, the, the biggest one on the property steps out, but, but there was no shot. And so, um, he was pretty hung up and dead set on, on trying to shoot that deer. And, and it was really nice weather. Uh, so the next night we go out and it's, uh, it's a, it's a little bit slow. He passed on a bunch of does and, and I'm telling him, you know, shoot whatever you want. And so I said, well, I know there's a six pointer that's around here. That's kind of a bully. He'd be a good one to take out. And he's like, all right. So we rattled him in and like, it's that easy. Right. But uh, long story short, we, we ended up rattling him in and his name's Dawson. I said, are, you know, you let me know when you want to stop him. And again, we're in a blind, he's using the muzzle loader with uh, a scope on it. And the deer keeps walking and walking and I'm waiting for him to tell me. And finally he's like, okay, well I stop it. And let me tell you, if you never heard a muzzle loader go off inside of a blind, um, <laughs> when you're not shooting it, I mean, I, I swear my right ear is still ringing, but yep. so the whole blind after the shot dropped about a foot and there was a fresh snow on it, but I'm thinking maybe it was a concussion or whatever, but you know, with a muzzle loader, you got tons of smoke. Right. So anyway, we go out there and there's no blood. Uh, you know, I watched the deer run. It didn't look hurt. Um, so we got back after it. And as soon as we get back in the blind, I noticed that he shot through one of the poles. Um, so that's what, that's what made it drop. But gotcha. so we let it cool off for a day. And then, um, it was the last day of the season that, that he could harvest a deer and it was cold and rainy, windy. Um, you know, typically something that a, a nine-year-old doesn't want to go out and sit in. And uh, we were, we were on the way out to the blind, and he goes, Dad, if, if it's got antlers tonight, I'm shooting it. I said, that sounds like a good plan, buddy. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, and he did. He, he shot a, a, a four-point, and the thing had a huge body. And, you know, I just I made sure that he knew that that was a trophy, um, no matter what. I mean, every whether it's a doe, they're all trophies. Um, but the, the two deer that he shot, in the last two years have trumped any of my hunts. It's just been uh, um, very rewarding for me to, to see his passion for it. Um, but uh, I guess, I guess that's my story. Very, very cool. Jake, what, what do you have for us? Well, you know, um, yeah, I haven't killed a, a bunch of giant deer. I'd have to say probably uh, the, the most memorable hunt that I ever had was uh, it actually resulted in a miss. And I was, uh, like I said, I I didn't start bow hunting until 2008. And uh, so I've I've been learning quite a bit. And uh, I think it was probably 2009, I I met um, an old boxing coach of mine. And he lived uh, north of me about uh, eight miles and uh, ran into him. And he's like, yeah, I got all kinds of, you know, ground to hunt. Um, So I went up there and, uh, you know, like I said, I had, I don't have a lot of experience. I don't really know. I didn't know anybody other than my father-in-law that, uh, that, that even hunted deer. Cause I'd always been a, a, you know, bird chaser, you know, pheasants and ducks and geese and stuff. And, um, so I got permission, uh, put my stand in a bad spot, uh, watch the deer go everywhere, but by me. <laughs> and, uh, I got frustrated and, uh, I started asking a bunch of questions and my father-in-law moved my stand, uh, got myself into a good spot. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I wasn't smart enough to know what I didn't know. And uh, lo and behold, uh, a deer that I had trail camera pictures of strolled right out in front of me. And um, he was at 30 yards, only I thought he was at 40. And, uh, of course, I shot right over his back. 
And uh, I thought, well, no big deal. You know, I'll uh, I'll see him again. Well, <clears throat> when I called my father-in-law, once I got out of there, he just started laughing and uh, proceeded to tell me that I'll never see that deer again, <laughs> uh, which I did not. I, I, I went out uh, religiously uh, hoping to see it again, but I learned a valuable lesson there. Um, and it seems like that's been kind of my my uh, my my deer hunting history here uh, since 2008 has been a series of learning curves. And uh, I'm thinking at some point here, I'm going to start laying them down because I'm a, I've experienced quite a, a few learning curves right. here over the last few years. So, gotcha. but I enjoy it. You know, it, like Dave said, I, this was the best year I ever had. I got pulled back on two deer that were, you know, 160 plus, um, just didn't get the angles, you know, got to where I needed to be. Uh, kind of executed my plan this year, but you know, fairly well, and uh, just uh, been soaking it up. But at the end of the day, you know, creating that plan and um, uh, it, it's just been it's it's just a lot of fun. Whether or not you get to lay a big one down, you know, I look forward to to, to doing doing a lot of that in the future. But I, I do absolutely enjoy it. I enjoy taking the lumps and learning, um, taking the adversity. Um, you know, I've had le- lots of opportunities to shoot 140 inch deer. Um, but I, 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 I truly believe I, I have made a commitment to managing for age, no matter where I am, I get a lot of grief in Southern Iowa for not shooting some of the deer and, you know, if they're old, that's fine. We'll take them, but you know, 140 inch, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old, great, you know, but, uh, um, you know, you kind of, you, you set your your guidelines and then you try to stick to them as much as you can so that you don't change once, you know, you see that borderline deer, uh, you know, coming down the trail. So, um, it's been a lot of learning for me and I absolutely enjoy it. Uh, 100%. So very cool. Excellent. Both very, very, very good stories. Thanks for sharing those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. All right. You guys ready for their 10 rapid fire questions? I think so. (laughs) <laughs> sure. All right. Now, I did not prep you for for this section because I think they, they're better off the cuff. So what I'll do is I'll just – I have 10 of them. I'll bounce back and forth. So you can each answer okay. the same question. Okay. Uh, let's start with Dave. Dave, what is your number one hunting tip of all time? Stay scent free. Love it. Jake? Oh, man. Make sure to bring your release. <laughs> that's a good one. Yep. I'd change mine if I could. Stay safe, wear your harness. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 there's so many. There's so many we can pick. From. Yeah. yeah. Yep, I'm with you. All right. Uh, Jake, what's that one thing that you can't live without if you're in the if you're in your tree stand, you're or if you're in your tree stand, you realize you don't have it with you, you kinda a little panic sets in because you just feel like you're not gonna have a good night. What's that one thing for you? I don't get too uh, caught up in, in much of that. Uh yep. You know, I, I don't really, I, I don't know. I don't know what it'd be to be honest with you. Okay. No problem. Dave, do you have one? Superstitions. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been out there a couple of times where I forgot my grunt collar binoculars and that about ruins my day. Yep. Range finder. There you go. Range if I forget finders. my range finder, I know I'm in trouble. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a big one for me too. Um, uh, Dave, how old are you today? 41. <laughs> I didn't think about it for All a minute. Right. What would the 41-year-old Dave Graham tell the 20-year-old Dave, knowing what you know today? Take it slower and enjoy. Yep. Take take life slower than I did, like, say, in my 20s and, and uh, just enjoy it. You know, I, I was always so uh, running around looking for success and, and uh, you know, on the road a lot. And I just, uh, you know, I, I settled down in, in my 30s, but. You know, the, the 20s were kind of a blur just being on the road all the time. And, and right. so that would be it. Gotcha. All right. Jake, what about you? Um, I'd, I'd probably just say relax. It's it's going to it's going to happen um, and to stay focused. Um, I have a tendency that when things don't always go my way, I, I uh, my mind kind of tends to wander. So I, I'd probably just tell myself to relax. It'll all be fine. Right. And uh, just stay focused. Gotcha. All right. Very good. Um, Jake, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Mm, boy, that's a great one. <laughs> don't answer. The, uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to keep it fairly uh, politically free. But, you know, I I think as Americans, one of my big pet, pet peeves that's going on right now would have, have to be that um, there's a lot of people that tend to want to give up freedoms that a lot of other people have uh, paid the ultimate price for that have died. Yep. Uh, defending and um, I'm a huge believer in freedom and uh, it really is a huge pet peeve of mine when uh, people just want to give that up 
Uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Cause you'll get me on a tangent. And we'll, <laughs> right. You'll have to cut me off. <laughs> we don't want to save cell phone battery. He'll die. So it's, it's just respect and freedom and what others prior to us have given us. And then those, those people that just are willing to just give it up. And I, I think it's way too important. Gotcha. Very good. Dave, how about yourself? Um, I'm on the same exact lines. Um, that, that's a huge pet peeve of mine. And, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in law enforcement or, uh, you know, retired, um, veterans and, uh, just the kind of a lack of respect going around in, in today's society. Um, it, it just, they, they deserve all the, the thanks they can get. And, and, you know, on the show, I guess, gives us a little bit of platform to say thank you, all of all of you, you know, for serving us and our country. And mm-hmm. uh, we appreciate it. Very, very good. Absolutely. I, I like, I love both your answers. All right. Mm-hmm. Jake, you, uh, you meet a stranger in a hotel lobby at a hunting convention somewhere in the world and they strike up a conversation. They ask you what you do for a living. What do you say? Um, you know, I, I, I guess it's just as simple as, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty, uh, uh, to the point, I guess I'm not always the best, uh, conversationalist in the world. Small talkers, <laughs> not my game. I'll tell you. Not your thing. Uh, right. we all got our you know struggles in life and that's mine. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a I'm a licensed real estate broker in the state of Iowa, um, and uh, you know I, I got a I got a small team of people that I work with, and I truly enjoy it. Um, I love the, the the challenges that come along with it, and um, it's it's uh, it's a very rewarding uh, lifestyle that that we get the the um, honor of of living. You know, and again, that kind of goes back to our previous conversation, right? is that others have come before us and, and given us this opportunity. And, and I think that uh, being a real estate broker is, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a great life. Very cool. All right. Dave, what would you say? I guess it depends if I'm, if I'm out of Iowa, I sell tree stands. <laughs> if, I, if I'm in Iowa, I sell farms and then I can sell you a tree stand for your farm. <laughs> um, no, it's again, the, the real estate is that's, I mean, that's my job. Um, that's, that's what really pays the bills. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say where I work and who I work for. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm blessed to, to be with this company and to have Jake as a mentor, um, has, has been priceless. Very, very First good. time I ever heard that. See, we only compliment My each other. My goodness. When we're on. A lot of yeah. firsts when you're on the radio. Yeah. I like this. <laughs> All right. This next question is easy. Uh, Dave, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh man, you guys don't want to know. I I'm on this 24 day challenge right now, and so oh, I'm, I'm turning a new leaf. Uh, so this morning I had peanut butter on a low carb wrap. Sound good? Uh, yeah, you had me at peanut butter, but you yeah. lost me at low lost carb me. wrap. Yeah. Sure All right, very good. Jake, what, how about yourself? Well, I it was just simply two eggs. I've got we've got a bunch of chickens at home, and. Uh, they are pounding out the eggs right now, and we are getting backed up. So nice. every nice. chance I get, I eat eggs. Nothing like a good farm fresh egg. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's boring, but uh, <laughs> it, it is reality. <laughs> All right. All right. You, uh, Jake, you get your own billboard on the side of a highway, and it's a blank canvas. What would you put mm-hmm. on it? Wow. Um, you know, I, I'd probably, uh, it'd probably have a, a picture like what we've got in the office. You know, of a of a scenic northeast Iowa uh, hillside uh, with a little bit of timber and a and uh, and a farm. You know, and um, it probably has something to do with the the, the uh, something to the effect of um, um, uh, you know the memories that we make in life. You know, how do you want to spend your life? Uh, what do you want to? You know, it, it's really all we have is memories, and 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 we talk about that a lot around here. And um, sometimes you got to take a little risk. Um, you know, sometimes the 40 acres in the house I live on, you know, gets a little expensive, but you know, I've got five kids and at the end of the day, um, it's, 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 it's allowed them to have the horses that they want. I get to see them really uh, become the people that they really want to be. And so, you know, I'd have to say it'd be something like that. It'd be a pretty scenic picture and, uh, just something alluding to, um, you know, uh, what, what, what the, what the land affords us and the memories and the lifestyle that we get from that. Gotcha. Very, very nice. Dave, how about yourself? What would you put on your billboard? You know, I, Jake and I are pretty similar when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, again, it'd, it'd be 
you know, just the beautiful landscape of Iowa. Um, but you know, it wouldn't be advertising for me. It would be uh, a thank you to, you know, our veterans and, and service men and women. Gotcha. Yep. Very cool. <laughs> All right, Dave, I, if I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Ryan Wheelington. Uh, Ryan is the owner and the, uh, inventor of advanced takedown tree stands. And we're talking about a family man here whose family truly comes first, but yet he's built one of the most innovative products to hit the market, um, in the hunting industry. Um, but I, I see success more as the life you, you live versus maybe the money you make. And, you know, Jake would fall into the same category. I mean, we're talking about just great husbands, great fathers. Um, and you know, I, I just want to emulate that. Gotcha. Very cool. Jake, how about yourself? Oh, that's a, that, that's a tough one for me. Um, you know, because normally I, I don't I don't like to talk about myself, but in this particular case, you know, I, I look at, at my own life and I, I think I, I think it's I've been pretty successful. Um, so I guess I, I'm normally not a big self promoter, but it, but it, this time when you asked that question, that's what popped into my head. I, I look at my family, my wife, um, and I, I'm truly how blessed I am. I, honestly, uh, you know, I I just think that that when I when I think of success. That's, that's what I look at. Um, you know, it is those relationships with family. Um, it, it, you can have all the money in the world. Some of the craziest, loneliest people I've ever met have a lot of money. You right. know? Um, and so it's not about the money on the success, but I, I, I truly believe it, it. I've had success in life and, and with the help of my wife, um, you know, we, we've got a great family and, and I guess that's what I would say. Very good. Love it. All right. Jake, what's a day in your life look like? Well, you know, it can kind of vary quite a bit. You know, the thing with our business is sometimes you just can't, you don't even have time to, to really react or think because you've got to be, you know, meeting somebody at, in one county uh, to look at a property to list for sale. And then, you know, uh, you got to be running to show another property, get an offer come in. Uh, you know, that's the one thing with our business is you never know what's going to happen. Uh, so the day can vary you know, quite a bit, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I like the structure, you know, I like structure and it's a crazy business and we don't get a lot of it, but, uh, um, you know, the ideal day would, would it, you know, kind of include, um, you know, that, you know, that, that listing uh, opportunity and, um, you know, presenting an offer. Uh, I normally, um, depends on the time of the year. It's a lot easier to get up, you know, when the sun's coming up at six o'clock in the, in the early summer, you know, in the morning, uh, than it is right now. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I tend to get to the office just a little bit later uh, this time of the year, um, you know, normally anywhere between, you know, 7.30 and 8.30 and um, try to take care. Normally I got something uh, laid out that I just, uh, as a priority first thing in the morning, I need to get taken care of before the emails and phone calls and helping other agents starts in because then, you know, I get kind of sidetracked. But um, I normally try to be home uh, you know, at supper time, if I can, sometimes that's not possible, but that's what I like to be able to do. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the weekends I'm fine with, with working, uh, showing property, presenting offers, you know, whatever we got to do, but, uh, I, I like to be at home with the family as much as possible. So very cool. All right, Dave, how about yourself? Uh, you know, very similar, obviously with the, the same jobs that we do. Um, you know, I, I, take great pride in, in being able to see my wife and kids head to school. My, my wife's a teacher um, at the school that my kids go to. Um, so, you know, a typical day, see them off and then head to the office. Uh, sometimes I wonder why I have a home office because it seems like any real estate work I do is, is here um, at our actual office. But um, it's amazing how many people email you after midnight. Um, so you open your computer in the morning and, and you have a ton of emails to respond to, um, you know, and, and start checking, you know, new listings. It, it might not be our listing, um, but we, we might have a buyer for it, you know. So uh, if there's something new on the market, uh, you know, we'll definitely, I mean, that's our job. We're, we're working for, for somebody that wants to buy a piece of land. So um, that's that's usually what the, 
the first half of the day consists of. And then, you know, like Jake said, uh, we're either showing showing properties uh, or, or talking about it, you know, and, and if nothing else, like we, we had an awesome meeting today with a, a marketing company um, that, that I think is going to do great things for us. So, um, but it, it's always different and that's, that's what I love. Gotcha. Very good. All right. Let's switch it around. Dave, what's a deer hunting day in your life look like? Oh man. Uh, well, I'm, I'm up and at them pretty early. Uh, I like to get in about probably half hour, but, um, before legal shooting time, which is a half hour before, uh, sunrise. Yep. Um, you know, if it's the rut, I'm, I'm definitely an all day sitter. Um, and you know, feel that I, I do my homework. So I'm always packing a, you know, a, a sandwich or, you know, a couple Gatorades and waters and, and, uh, you know, but I'm still, I find myself working quite often in the tree stand. Um, you know, that's the great thing about this business also is a lot of it is, <laughs> right. well, I mean, you know, a lot of it's uh, social media for your marketing and a lot of it's via email sure. and, and text message. So, um, you know, I can, I can actually call my tree stand, my other office and, and not too many people get offended. Which would be by another it. good tip is to make sure you turn your phone on silent before you get to the tree stand. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's always a moment of panic when all of a sudden it's so and it never fails it always seems to go off when there's deer around you oh yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, you know and then the the greatest part is when i pull in my driveway and and it's usually my son runs out and did you get one and no you know and well did you see any and oh yeah i saw some and uh well why didn't you shoot them and and so we're, we're still working that out but uh you know just <laughs> I love sharing stories with, with family and friends. So yep. that's usually what the night entails. Very cool. And, and Jake, what's a, what's your deer hunting day in life look like? Um, you know, I'd, I'd say it's, it's fairly similar. Um, you know, I, I'm completely fine. You know, I did more all day sits this year than I ever have before. Um, you know, I guess I'd like to maybe get, uh, um, the only downfall that I had this last year is I, I wasn't really committed to a, a solid plan i was you know beans is that uh you know you're in real estate we we have so little control over our schedule and you you plan to go out one day and then bam you got you got to take care of work you know and so i, I never get to hunt and plan my hunts really the way i want unless i plan to take take off and and, and go two hours south and um you know and, and just let everybody know hey i'm not going to be around so um, but most ideally is I'm hunting around my house, you know, I've got ground, you know, I live on 40 acres and I've got ground, um, right in the same uh, mile that I can hunt. So normally that's what that would be is, is I, I'd get up, um, and, uh, early do the, do the morning hunt, um, you know, for as long as I can until I got to get, get down and get into work, uh, try to get my work wrapped up and try to get back out for, you know, an afternoon hunt. So, um, that that normally I, I don't normally get to do too many all day sits, but uh, I got to kind of pick and choose my battles. But uh, um, I think for this next year I'll, I'm going to be a little more rigid on my on my schedule. You know, a lot of the guys that want to buy hunting properties get kind of uh, you know a little antsy during hunting season. So a lot of times, but it was that's the way it was this year was listings. I'm not complaining. You know, showings uh, during that that you know peak rut. You know. Uh, situation so i didn't even really get going until probably november 14th i think was uh, the first day that i got up north to go um and then you know kind of catching the, the last few days so um i guess that but most generally it's it's nearby a morning and an afternoon hunt gotcha all right very good all right those are the 10 rapid fire questions guys you did fantastic and thank we you survived. thanks for uh, letting <laughs> us into your world a little bit more very very yeah. nice uh, where can we find more information about your real estate company and your your agency? Yeah, we've got um, we've got we're on Facebook. We've got Huffland Company uh, Facebook page. Um, our website is hufflandcompany.com. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, all, all of our listings and, and a little bit of information about us individually on the website. Uh, the Facebook page we will normally try and post some stuff of interest. Uh, you know, uh, we do put some residential stuff on there as well. Um, but, uh, acreages and farms, um, it's kind of how we've, we've branded ourselves and our followers, uh, kind of, uh, respect that on, uh, on Facebook. So, um, then we'll be getting into a little bit, uh, 
you know, the, the thing is that we're, we're going to be dedicated to this year is uh, more video blogging um, on the land, acreage, and even the residential side. But, but um, you know, that, that's going to be a big part um, of this upcoming year is uh, trying to get information out that way out of folks to be of some kind of help and service, uh, you know, give a little guidance and, and uh, certain situations to maybe be a help to people. So Gotcha. Very, very cool. So the YouTube channel will be getting a little busier. I love it. Love that social media stuff when it comes to yeah. anything whitetail. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, guys, this has been an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. We, I've learned a ton. This has been fantastic. Yep. And I, I really enjoyed listening to uh, how you guys go about uh, fi- finding property and, and what a buyer should think about and what a seller should think about and kind of how you uh, the, the fascinated with the whole thing about the walnut trees and the timber and yeah. the, the actual income producing mm-hmm. properties that mm-hmm. you can make out of land. I had no idea. It's fascinating. Yep. Well, we appreciate your platform and you having us all. I knew that the topic of buying a recreational piece of property that you would use to hunt on would be an interesting topic, but I had no idea that we'd go on for almost two hours talking about it. And I didn't feel like we covered everything in as much detail as we could have. So I hope everybody is a, appreciates the show um, because I certainly got into it and that's probably the reason for the length of it. But um, just some really good topics that we covered uh, anywhere from game management to return on investment when you buy a piece of property to how you can generate revenue, um, actually getting people to come in and, and uh, take care of some some of the timber that's worth money, um, doing row crops. And, and Dusty, you're, you're familiar with all that stuff. Um, where and you know, I don't always think about land generating some kind of revenue, but it can. And you've, you've lived a life of this, Dusty, where you, you actually generate um, money from the things that grow out of the ground all the time. And it's not something that's not quite... Um, familiar with uh here but for you that's been a life oh yeah for sure ohio is full of uh farming and agricultural and it's something that uh i recognize you know what they was talking about right away and and there's government programs that uh you know you can plant uh native grasses and, and let the uh, area grow up uh and they'll actually pay you for the the land that you use for the native grasses and the crp and it's it's pretty amazing what kind of programs are out there for the farmer and 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 for the landowner and uh, for the person that's just an outdoor enthusiast that uh, wants to get back to you know conservation and the environment. I thought it was very interesting, and and I, I would imagine growing up in in that environment, Dusty, you kind of uh, you know just kind of put it in your head, and you don't really think that you know what you know, but you do. You know a lot of about that. So for us that aren't familiar with that. It's an extremely interesting topic because we just, we can't, we don't live it every day. So it's just, it's just fascinating. I'm glad you've always shared what you know about that with me. And it was nice to dig deep with Dave and Jake. Oh yeah, for sure. It's definitely uh, something that, you know, if, if you've been around it, it's just, you know, second nature to you. But if you don't know anything about it, it's always nice to have somebody, you know, I'm, I'm far from a, a highly educated person to talk to about agricultural but you know i can i can probably hang with with most of the guys that are super educated about it uh I, I, i've not been to school for it but been raised around it and grew up on a farm and my dad still farms a day and i still farm and animals and you know it's just uh just a way of life right yeah you, know, you learn a lot when you're right in it instead of just studying about it probably learn a lot more about it actually when you're living it day right to day sure. Yep, very cool. Speaking of topics of, of learning, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week? Yeah, and I'm going to refer to a few questions I've had over the last few weeks of whether or not to leave your tree stand out in the woods or not. The Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Uh, personal preference on my end, I take everything down, bring it in. Uh, not not only, um, you know, it gives you the option next year to reset a set that maybe you need to make some adjustments to. If you just left it hang there, you'd probably just climb back up and, and hunt the same stand. But, uh, you know, not only that aspect of it, but... As far as 
weather and the sun and the rain and the snow and the conditions and you know the mother nature will tear a stand up faster than anything so a safety aspect comes into play when you leave your stands and leave them hanging in the tree or a ladder stand or a climb or whatever you you got out there even your ground blinds it just the weather tears them up and you know that that stuff all costs money and uh it's that time of year to get your stands down and and bring them in and store them in a dry place uh, even if you can just throw them up in the rafters of your garage or wherever you can you can uh, make the effort to put them up and and keep them nice and then you're not going out and then you know having a cable that's rusted out break on you on a hang on stand or you get to climbing and the, the ladder sticks uh, one of the one of the steps break off and you skin your leg all up and you fall and just go out and get your stands down, bring them in. And, 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 you know, some people's got a lot of stands and I understand that I've got quite a few myself, but I try to make room for them in a dry, dry storage area and get them out of the weather. That That's rough on them. And, and it's, uh, you know, definitely a safety factor. So get them stands down. Gotcha. Uh, great, great tip. And something I often overlook, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm with you. I need to get out there and go grab my stuff. Very good. Very, very good. So Dusty, where can we find you? When you're not hanging out here in Big Buck Studios with me, well, you can you can shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry dot com. You can look me up on Instagram, Twitter at Chasing Antler, or shoot me a message or give me a like over at uh, Chubby Tines Outdoors right there on Facebook. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Um, I would email me at Jay at BigBuckRegistry dot com. Definitely the best place to to reach out to me and I will return every email that I get. Uh, you can always leave us a voicemail at 724-613-2825. Uh, we don't answer that line directly, but we do get the messages and we, w- we do return phone calls. So if you'd like to reach out over there, uh, if you'd like to become a part of the, the contingent of the Big Buck Registry over on our Cornerstone flagship Facebook page, where we are about to turn 250,000 fans. Uh, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook. Uh, like like Facebook, we are on all other social media platforms for the most part. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube, and uh, we're on Google+. Plus. We're actually over there as well. You can listen to this show on iHeartRadio, on iTunes, Stitcher, Blueberry, and pretty much any other directory that grabs that RSS feed and uh, rebroadcasts all of our content. So uh, if you just Google it, you'll find lots and lots of places to listen to the show. But on iTunes, uh, if you wanted to go directly, if you're an Apple user, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes. If you're an Android or Google user, probably Stitcher is not a bad choice, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Stitcher. And uh, we actually have an app uh, for both Google and for Apple and it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash app. If you'd like to download the app on your iPhone for free, or if you want to go over and download the Google version or the Android version, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash G app. I think that's pretty much all the places we are hanging out. If you would like to become a donor, a patron of this show, we can always use your helping hand, and it doesn't have to be much. Whatever you can spare, we were we would love to get some more donations going and we need uh, we do have a budget we do have costs associated with the show too so that we can bring you that good content each and every week and we we have a place set up where you can actually go to help and participate in making this show possible and if you go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge you'll see all of the different levels that you can pledge to So I think that is everything we need to cover. Dusty, it's been a great show, and unfortunately we have to go, but we will be back next week. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. 